Good afternoon, everyone. It, this is uh, Thursday afternoon, January 21st, 1.40 p.m. Welcome to Senate Education, where we are going to be looking at uh, Senator McCormick's bill today. I believe the number is S, I believe it's S-17. 17, yes. Uh, prior to that, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping items, if you will, uh, or updates. Please, uh, following up on the multiple conversations we've had about education finance, uh, I just want to let people know, please continue to ask the questions. They're great questions. Feel free to make appointments with uh, Joint Fiscal um, in uh, just work to, to wrap your head around these kinds of things. And if there's any, if you want to hear more, please just let me know. I'm happy to schedule additional time. If you want to do it on your own, that's fine as well. But uh, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, sometimes it just takes a little while and, and the questions have been great and just want to encourage people to continue to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, uh, senators may recall that we uh, asked uh, Jeff Fannin to take a leadership role in trying to understand, you know, the, the current situation in our schools as it relates to COVID and uh, sort of a post-COVID environment, if you will, uh, around what our students, uh, faculty, and staff might need. He was hoping to come back on Tuesday with that report uh, and share it with us, uh, a report that I hope we'll work on together, and then uh, as well as with uh, uh, Senator Kitchell and Appropriations and Senator Lyons and Health and Welfare and, and other relevant committees. Uh, but that is going to be postponed a little bit. They just need some additional time, so I would expect that a little bit later in the week. Great. So, uh, Senator McCormick, uh, it's an honor to have you here. As uh, many of you know, Senator McCormick was once the chair of this committee, uh, certainly somebody that is a deep thinker about educational issues. I appreciate him very much putting this topic uh, on our calendars by entering this bill. The What I've asked, um, Senator McCormick to do is to take us through the bill. We'll then hear from uh, the members of the Agency of Education to talk a little bit about what's happening right now statewide as it relates to civic education. We'll then hear from uh, Mark Snelling uh, and one of his associates, uh, associates from the Snelling Institute. Uh, and they uh, will be talking to us as well as our other two witnesses um, uh, Mr. Scar uh, Sarbrad from the American Institute on Progress. I, I know I'm getting the name wrong, but, and then uh, a Dr. Uh, Levinson from uh, Harvard School of Education, also talking to us about, you know, how do we educate and foster a strong democracy in the United States? You know, there are things that can be done in schools. There are things that can be done outside of schools. You know, we're looking at one bill, but how do we, you know, as legislators work to, foster a strong uh, democracy. And I'm sure it's, it would, it, it's gonna take a range of things. You know, we have jurisdiction over, over education uh, to some extent, um, but this is something that I think a conversation we'll be having with colleagues. And, and what's great is we have representation from other committees on this, uh, other key committees that might also uh, share this uh, topic with chairs and can help us to have this conversation. So with that, Senator McCormick, uh, would you mind taking us through uh, yes. S-17? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for me to be back. Uh, this is uh, one of the, well, there's no unimportant committee in the Senate, but certainly the work that this committee does is, is of great importance. Um, I wanna point out a few things before I get into the bill itself. Uh, one is uh, that Although I have as much of a political ego as anyone else, I really do not have a proprietary interest in the particular language of this bill. My intention is to put the issue on the table. And I think that there, it, the issue calls for a discussion of, of exactly what a civics curriculum should look like, how we would go about evaluating it and so on. And, um, uh, when I taught government uh, in uh, the state colleges, I would always say, you know, the, that a bill will often not, it's in its original form, will not survive the committee process. 
And uh, in this case, I, I welcome that. Um, I expect this committee will, will improve. I'm laying an idea before you. I want to point out also draw the committee's attention to the bipartisan co-sponsorship of this bill. Uh, we are the sponsors of this bill are all over the map uh, ideologically. And uh, years ago when Joe Benning and I tried to pass basically the same bill, he and I both said that it showed how confident we each are in our own opinions because each of us is convinced a better educated uh, public will more likely agree with me. And uh, that, uh, that, that, but the other thing it shows is that whatever disagreements we may have, those disagreements occur in a context of broad agreement. We agree or should, we at least theoretically agree on the ground rules for dealing with the disagreement. Uh, we may argue over whether the pitch was a ball or strike, but we don't argue over how many strikes make an out. Three strikes make an out unless it's a foul ball for the third strike. Uh, there are things that are beyond argument. We're all supposed to know this. The other thing I would point out is that I mentioned that I, I taught government in the state college system, and people often mistakenly referred to me as a college professor, uh, and the one real college professor in the Senate would often bridle at that and point out that I was adjunct, not, not a professor. But I would also say that I really didn't teach uh, government at a college level. It was a college course, but really what I, I realized, you teach your students at where they are. I was teaching seventh grade social studies because the what people don't know in our, in our republic is really startling. And I think we all have examples of that, depending on one's ideological orientation, uh, they might cite different examples, but I will just do a, a one for example was the whole controversy about whether or not um, uh, President Obama was a Muslim. And it was often the argument often centered on the truth or falsehood of that, that he was not a Muslim, he was, he was a, a Christian. The United States Constitution explicitly and unambiguously says there is to be no religious test for public office. When John McCain said, if Obama were a Muslim, that should, that should not be a problem. He was right, but he wasn't particularly heroic or, or noble. He was saying, yeah, the constitution means what it says. I think large you know, people often in terms of say the separation of church and state, they, they think of the first amendment. The fact is this is article six and it's, and it's right in there in the, in the original version it, and it's still the constitution. Uh, but there are, there are all sorts of other um, examples. There are people, uh, and again, I'm going to use my examples based on what struck me. Um, people of, of a different ideology will probably cite other examples of just ignorance of the Constitution. I once referred to uh, health care as a right. Now, you, one might agree that it is, or one might agree that it might, might say it's not. But the response I've gotten more than once when I say uh, health care is a right, the response I get is, well, where in the Constitution does it say that? The implication being, if the Constitution does not explicitly list a right, it's not a right, which means the person has not read the Ninth Amendment, which says the existence of a listing of rights in this constitution shall not be taken to preclude the existence of other rights. Again, it's, it's not like there's a lot of wiggle room there. That's a pretty explicit uh, statement. We are a democratic republic. People will often say we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Well, we are structured as a republic. We are constituted as a republic, but we are a democratic republic. And if the demos, the people, are not there, then you might have democratic institutions, but you don't have a democracy. 
you have uh, the, the analogy I would use is I remember walking in the woods once and seeing uh, the trunk of a dead white birch, uh, but it was still standing and I, I, I was a little tired and I went to lean on it and it fell over and broke apart and there was nothing but sawdust inside. You had the structure, you had the bark, but there was really nothing inside of any substance. And I, I fear that, that, that we could find ourselves to, I mean, we can argue over the extent to which we found ourselves, find ourselves in that position already. But one of the original purposes of public education, uh, if we go back to the or 19th century Horace Mann and early founders of public education, one of the purposes is to equip people to support themselves, that's true. Uh, to prepare people for their lives. But one of the purposes, one of the original purposes of public education is to prepare citizens, to educate citizens as to what our, the public is, how it works, how it operates. Um, so I, I would, what the bill does is, is quite simply, it, 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 it says that, that uh, uh, sets up a, a study of civics as a, requirement for a high school diploma and the passing of a test that, that one understands the, the, the fundamentals of American civics. Now, exactly what that curriculum would look like, I think, would probably be a, a subject of debate. Uh, just a little war story here. I tried this about 25 years ago. I introduced this very bill, or at least a bill with these very provisions. And then the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator Shumlin, and the Senate Republican Leader, uh, Senator Bloomer, uh, agreed that the bill should not see the light of day because it would uh, be hitting a hornet's nest. It would, it would just be too controversial. And my answer then and my answer now is bring it on. I think it would be an exciting and important debate. And yes, some people will come out of the woodwork with nutty ideas. Uh, but uh, I, I, again, speaking of democracy, I, I trust that in the end, we would arrive at a reasonable curriculum. I think I could personally write it in a couple of hours, but I'm not asking for to, to do that. But I mean, you want to know um, how we are constituted, which is why they, we call that document the Constitution. Uh, what are the what the, the what people don't know are things like what are the three branches of government, what is the separation of powers, what is checks and balances, uh, uh, how does the bill of what rights does the, do the Bill of Rights and the Fourteenth Amendment protect, and then also where have we uh, articulated noble concepts but failed to live up to them. And what are the problems attendant to, to our I ideals? And that will cause some controversy because there are people who would say, you don't want to dwell on the negative that undermines patriotism. And then there are other people who will say, as long as the darker side exists, our noble ideals are just hypocritical lies. And, and uh, I can tell you as a history, as a teacher of history and a teacher of government, I have been accused both of promulgating and perpetuating our racist, imperialist, sexist, exploitational founding myths. And I've been accused of undermining patriotism and running our country down. Actually, as, and for me as a, as, as, a, as a teacher, my goal was to tell the truth. And the truth is the Declaration of Independence says what it says. It's inspiring, except when it's not. Uh, and it was written by a slaveholder. Both, both statements are true. And what we do with that contradiction is one of the things that we as Americans have to deal with. I don't think the Fed, I think Jefferson's being a slaveholder may uh, undermine, discredit him. It does not fully discredit the Declaration of Independence. He somehow managed to articulate not an original or revolutionary political philosophy. It was boilerplate in 1776. Jefferson said he wrote a document that he expected every educated man in, in Europe would, would find obviously true. But uh, nevertheless, it articulates a good philosophy of government and, uh, and uh, 
uh, our um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Our, um, our 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 citizens should know what the Declaration of Independence says and where it comes from, and also know where the contradictions are. I guess that's my my quick uh, answer. Very helpful. On what the bill does, and thank you. And and I, um, I hope hope the committee can go someplace with it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I appreciate uh, knowing that the genesis of it and uh, committee questions for Senator uh, McCormick. Uh, Senator Taranzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, thank you, Senator McCormick for being here. Nice to see you. Um, I uh, am one of the co-sponsors of this uh, bill. One of the actually first bills I've been able to co-sponsor as a new senator and uh, i appreciate the opportunity to sign on i think you started off correctly if you look at the number of co-sponsors and the vast differences and beliefs of those co-sponsors it it says something about the uh integrity and worthiness of this bill and uh, uh i think it's important in this day and age uh, especially in this day and age where we have a country so divided and people on the left and people on the right are so passionate uh about their beliefs and their and they have dug in their heels so much that we just don't see that balance and that cooperation that I believe the Constitution was designed for the checks and balances that you talk about, uh, Senator mm -hmm. McCormick. I fear that many of our young adults and teenagers today uh, learn about American history on their favorite social media platform versus in the classroom yeah. from a, a non non biased perspective. And I think it's critical that civic ed education is back in the schools and people, just what you said, as simple as understanding the three branches of government and their, and their uh, responsibilities, knowing how our constitution came to be and, and the importance of it and so on. So I'm proud to have uh, been able to attach my name to this. And I certainly hope that um, this uh, bill becomes legislation and sees the light of day. So thank you for being here, Senator McCormick. And thank you to Chair Campion for allowing me to speak a few mm -hmm. minutes this morning. It's afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Terenzini. Thank Senator, you, Senator. Senator Hooker and then Senator Lyons. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Senator McCormick for bringing this up again. Uh, it's, uh, I'm just, my question is a requirement for graduation, but you mentioned seventh grade. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have any, any preference for when something, a course of this type would be offered. <sighs> I am happy to leave that to the Education Committee. Okay. All right. I remember being president of my civics club in eighth grade, and then there was no other, well, there, there were off and on civics courses. But one of the things that I um, is a little disheartening, two things actually. One was living in England for a year and realizing how much more young people knew about their country and their government than it seemed some of the kids that I knew, knew about our government and our country. And the second thing was watching the late show with, especially with Jay Leno, when he'd go out on the streets and ask questions about yeah. government and being um, amazed at some of the answers that he got. So I think yeah. you're on the right track and I too am happy to co-sponsor this bill. Thank you, Senator. And Senator. I was grateful for your support, Senator. Uh, Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you and thank you, Senator McCormick. This is such a timely topic. Um, it's, it's not just today, but it's every day and every part of our history. So I guess I guess I have some very practical questions to ask, and and mm -hmm. what your experience, of course. I remember when this was taken up when you introduced it years ago, and the the uh, majority leader and the or the minority leader and the pro tem <laughs> put a a cap on it. <laughs> um, yeah. But I do know, and I know that the House introduced a bill uh, similar or like this bill in 2018. Um, I don't know whether it was the same one or not, but they had uh, 79 or 80 or so sponsors equal 
to what we're seeing here with your bill. In other words, mm -hmm. a distribution of political beliefs, which I think is absolutely terrific. My, I guess my question boils down to how this uh, requirement uh, affects local control issues. So going, yeah. you know, we all have, I think we're all well steeped in the need for civics and democratic education. Uh, we really are. And, and I think, you know, we see some of it, but I know what the, I also know what it means to be on a school board when people are telling you what you have to do and what you have to teach. And even with the, um, uh, the, the student individual learning plans that we put in place, there was pushback at first and then everybody yeah. loved it. So I don't know, have you thought at all, given your experience with this about the effect that this is going to have at the local level? Is it gonna be seen as some heavy handed top down edict or is it going to be seen as really reinforcing democracy? Yeah. I, I can imagine things really going off the rails town by town. If, you know, if, we've, if, we, if the state doesn't give some guidance as to what it is we're looking for, uh, we do leave a lot to local control, but we already have state uh, curriculum requirements. And, and, this, uh, and the, what I'm looking for, where I'm seeing ignorance is not controversial or extreme stuff. It is things like, what are the three branches of government? What are their different powers? And you know, if you really want to get into it also, why this branch has this power and that branch has that power and so on. Uh, my sense is that we could find a curriculum that, that pretty much everyone uh, agrees on. I would, I would hope we could. By the way, I, I want to correct something. I misspoke. When I said uh, 25 years ago, the majority leader and the mi minority leader conspired Actually, it was the pro tem Shumlin and the minority leader, Senator uh, 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 Bloomer. I was the majority leader <laughs> at the time. Oh. <laughs> and, cra and crashed and burned. <laughs> yeah. I supported my own bill. <laughs> but you know, in, in any case, I, I think I, I understand the, the, the possibility, two possibilities. One is that it would be seen as heavy handed governing from Montpelier. Uh, and secondly, it could be seen as um, uh, you could have some mayhem out there, depending on the town, uh, depending on who decides to, to come to the school board meetings and, 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 and work on the curriculum. I think what we have to do is, is really, and this is why I think it would make a good discussion, is identify what are the areas that my Republican colleagues and I agree on. Because there are a lot, <laughs> and, and 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 that's the kind of stuff that, that we need to um, to emphasize. So yeah. I guess we have two uh, folks from the Agency of Education. Senator Lyons, did you have a follow up? Oh uh, no, I was just going to say uh, that my son-in-law uh, went through uh, citizenship, uh -huh. and he had great fun quizzing me about what he knew. It, that mm -hmm. was great. I answered all the questions, just so you know. But I was just going to ask. It was nip and tuck. <laughs> <laughs> How many members of Congress are there? Right, right. Go for that one. Anyway, uh, thank you. That's great, all. Senator Chittenden. Uh, you're muted, Senator. Uh, not. I think it's your end. Try it again. You hear me now? Yes. Perfect. My apologies. Uh, so I completely agree. Civics should be in every high school curriculum. I know I think fondly of my PWA, Public and International World Affairs class from uh, South Burlington High School. M the only pause I had and why I didn't respond to your email looking for co-sponsors is I just don't know if politicians should be deciding curriculum. And I'm new to this yeah. role. So that's why I'm really glad that the Department of Education is coming on next and they can give us an idea of how curriculum standards and requirements are usually established and to make sure the right people around the room are, are seeing how mm -hmm. this fits and balances with all of our school guidance that we offer in the state. That's a perfect introduction. Thank you, Senator. I am going to now uh, move it to our two um, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, to the in the agency of education, Martha. Wonderful to see you, Jess. Great to see you, uh, 
very grateful that you're both here with us today. And what we're hoping, uh, as I believe we mentioned in our introductory comments in, in our outreaches, is an understanding of what's happening right now uh, throughout our schools as it relates to civic education and educating for a democracy. You know, pre-K through 12, what's out there? What's happening? Um, what kinds of standards exist? Uh, it, also to Senator Chittenden's good question, in general, how do these things get established? Uh, how is it that, you know, uh, one might alter a civic education uh, curriculum? Uh, and um, then just your general thoughts on on the bill itself. But I'd like to start by having you both introduce yourselves uh, to the committee. Hi, I'm Martha Dice. I'm the Global Citizenship Specialist at the Agency of Education. So I oversee social studies, world language, and financial literacy. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Hi, and for the record, I'm Jessica Carolus. I'm Division Director of Student Pathways Division, which oversees personalized learning, proficiency-based learning, and coordinated curriculum, local comprehensive assessment systems, career technical education, flexible pathways, summer and after-school programs, adult education, education technology, and remote and continuity of learning. Thank you both. I'll let the two of you uh, take it from here in terms of uh, which of you would like to begin the conversation. Sure, and we did actually have a question for you, Chair Campion, which is, do you want us to display the materials we sent over or do folks have those in front of them? Uh, committee, uh, do you have them in front of you? Is that convenient? Senator no. Terenzi, do you have them also? I just wanna make sure everybody has them, you don't. All right, so let's let's display them so we all have them, if that's okay. That would be great. So can, thank okay. you. Okay, I think Jess is gonna display them and, and I'll start and I'm not gonna read them um, verbatim to you since you do have access to them but I'm gonna highlight some of the things that we've been doing over the last three plus years within the agency to support strong social studies and civic education, K-12. I'm not seeing, right, is anybody Go ahead else? And get started. Okay, sure. All right, so um, I'm sure you know, Title 16, um, chapter 23 talks about the, um, learning experiences that should be provided in a minimum course of study, which includes citizenship, history and government in the United States and Vermont. And, you know, it defines a, a minimum course of study as a learning experience that's adapted to students' age and ability. So it's a learning experience. Um, and then education quality standards 2120.5, um, enumerates the content that should be addressed annually, it should be rigorous and relevant and comprehensive uh, learning opportunities. And global citizenship is one of those items enumerated and it's broken down into um, I think five areas with civics being one of them specifically called out. Um, moving down um, with these initiatives and leadership and Right when I started at the Agency of Education, I was asked to present uh, for adoption new national standards to the State Board of Education, um, which I did. The State Board adopted the College, Career, and Civic Life C3 Framework for Social Studies State Standards um, around, I think it was October of 2017. It's a framework that's divided into four dimensions with inquiry, um, disciplinary concepts, sources, and action as the four specific dimensions. Within the disciplinary concepts, they specifically call out civics um, and three particular areas, civic and political institutions, applying civic virtues and democratic principles, and understanding processes, rules, and laws. And this particular dimension would be the area where um, Items specifically enumerated in the bill would be addressed. For example, you know the writings of Montesquieu and Hobbes and Locke, um, the um, principles of rule of law and popular sovereignty and federalism, um, understandings, students' understandings of the rights and responsibilities afforded within the Constitution to themselves and others. Um, so that content piece falls right into that um, dimension too. 
I also wanted to add that's not specifically addressed in here is once after right after these standards were adopted, the 712 um, social studies teacher endorsement was revised in 2018. And they utilized the C3 standards to base the endorsement for teacher licensure and specifically called out civics within that endorsement. I think it's 3.3. So our universities, besides teacher licensing, our universities um, are supposed to update their syllabi within, I believe it's two years to reflect that endorsement for any social studies teachers. Um, moving along, Act 77, 2013's Act 77 um, allowed educational experiences and different learning opportunities and flexible pathways for students. Um, and along with the proficiency-based requirements within education quality standards. In December of 2017, I had approximately 40 K-16 Vermont educators volunteer to develop um, K-12 proficiency-based graduation requirements and indicators that are now, uh, they were put up on the um, Agency of Education's website for any SUs and SDs to utilize um, when they developed their proficiency-based graduation requirements. Um, they specifically called out a civics proficiency and it's right there in italics for you, students act as productive citizens by understanding the history, principles and foundations of our American democracy and by acquiring the ability to become engaged in civic and democratic processes so that is, you know, as a graduation requirements, students are supposed to um, show evidence of civics proficiency. Um, we also included a link to a document of a survey that was done of SUs and SDs to show um, the proficiency, their proficiency-based graduation requirements and personalized learning plans. Um, so you have a link um, for that document. We also highlighted transferable skills as part of um, civic work that we've done in civic education, because you can't learn a, um, a concept in a vacuum. The students need to actually um, put, the, put it into action. Um, transferable skills are identified within 2120.5 uh, also in education quality standards. Um, within that description of skills is responsible and involves citizenship. Um, we've provided for you um, a sample of scoring criteria and a sample of a transferable skill graduation proficiency. About two years ago, the Agency of Education led um, the development of the Vermont Portrait of a Graduate, approximately 300 members of the community. It was students, um, educators, and members of the community um, worked on this idea that's now um, a sort of, it's a document on our website, but they determined, they um, determined the six attributes that Vermont graduates should um, be proficient in upon graduation. Um, learner agency, global citizenship is there, um, and they identified it um, as ex students have the ability to exercise their rights in a democratic society. Okay, so those two, academic proficiency, communication, critical thinking, and well-being. Um, the agency content specialists have taken it a step further, and we've all developed portraits of a graduate within our own discipline. So I, sh I share with you a link to the social studies portrait of a graduate. Um, so within those six attributes, I've identified specific areas like civic virtue, bias assessment, argumentation, tolerance, civic engagement, and deliberation that are all part of social studies. Um, and really, as a former civics teacher, they are front and center within civics education. Um, I bulleted some areas from the document, um, such as students construct arguments, they become cognizant of bias and value the dissonance of opinion. Um, they learn to practice tolerance and face when they're faced with differing opinions, points of views, color, cultures, religions, and understanding of gender. Um, the when they within a civics class, they have the analysis, the ability to analyze 
evidence that allows them to assess credibility of resources that represent multiple points of view with the understanding that sources may collide and differing viewpoints may alter how this data is perceived. So careful analysis demonstrates that words can communicate bias and students will be skilled at recognizing such partiality. That is a big piece of civic education, big piece of our current um, world. We also have a document to support that um, idea with um, called Continuity of Learning uh, Digital Literacy and Screen Time. So you have a link to that as well. Um, in 2018, I was asked to be a member of a civics task force made up of educators, administrators, curriculum directors, um, higher education, uh, members from the executive and legislative branch. Um, the focus of this group was to sort of look at the state of civics education within Vermont. Uh, several of the task members had the opportunity to present a module at the 2019 Vermont Annual um, Social Studies Alliance Conference. Um, we were um, very well received from educators and members of the public that um, attended the conference. Great questions were asked and we actually picked up people that wanted to be part of this task force. Um, COVID kind of curtailed the subsequent meeting, but hopefully we'll be getting that back together. Um, we the People is a program from the Center for Civic Education. It's um, where students have the opportunity to work in teams to present um, four minute um, response to civic related questions. They are then asked six minutes of impromptu questions um, I had I brought this program back to Vermont. I'm not quite sure how long it had been in hiatus, but in March of 2020, we had three schools, two of which um, received resources from a grant provided from the Agency of Education. So three schools, Williamstown, Poultney, and St. Johnsbury competed. Um, we had one legislator and 15 members of the Vermont Bar Association serving as judges. Um, I have a pretty amazing quote that I um, gleaned from one of the participants on how these kids took um, their, their content knowledge and sort of tied it to their everyday life in, in, in Vermont and in the nation. Um, both Pulteney and St. Johnsbury qualified to compete at the national finals, but COVID um, unfortunately ended that opportunity. I was not, and I think due to COVID, able to pick up any Vermont teams this year, but I did get great interest from the judges that participated offering to help prepare teams in the future. Um, finally, um, late in late spring 2020, I was approached by a nonprofit in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I taught civics and education, civics and financial literacy and civic education for 20 years. Um, I guess because of um, how I see civics as really um, community involvement, I was sort of seen as the civics guru in that system and within that community. Um, so I was approached with the idea of developing US history and civics modules tied with peace education. Um, so, um, Secretary French, well, my division director and Secretary French both gave me the opportunity to continue this work. So I have been utilizing the C3 standards and working with teachers in Alabama and North Carolina and the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute and the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte, as well as the New Gen Peace Builders to develop um, eight inquiry modules based off of the Institute of Economics and Peace's Eight Pillars of Peace, like um, of a well-functioning government and acceptance of the rights of others and ex um, acceptance of neighbors are some of the um, pillars that we worked off of. Um, we developed modules and I have a couple of names there. Can harm be mended? Did the civil rights movement end? Has the US lived up to the creed inscribed on the Statue of Liberty? Um, this beta, PD professional development will launches on January 28th, where teachers from both Alabama and North 
and um, Vermont will be working together through this professional development that will culminate in May. Um, and I guess that's um, it. I, I covered the six um, ideas that were in the document that we've provided for you. Thank you. Before we, we move on, let's take questions uh, on this section. And if I might, uh, can you just say something about when civic education starts? Is this something that starts in high school, middle school, mm -hmm. primary school? Um, we look at it across a K-12 continuum. And, and to be completely honest with you, I was asked to um, tie the C3 standards with the Vermont uh, it's the VELS, Vermont Early Learning um, Standards, um, because it starts in kindergarten or earlier to be a good citizen. Um, it, it's not something that you wait until you get to high school. Uh, Senator Perslick, please. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Ms. Deese, for the presentation. I think you're doing great work. I'm really interested in hearing your collaboration with our colleagues to the south on the peace modules. Um, and you know, one of the reasons I didn't sign on to this bill is because my experience with my own kids going through Vermont's programs is that they are getting a lot of civics. And it seems like AOE has been doing a lot of work on civics. And so I just, it seems with, what you didn't say, but what I take away from your presentation is it's kind of a uh, solution in search of a problem. W would you agree? I, Martha, you don't mind, I might take this. And Senator Campion, I'm not sure, do you want us to present the, the second portion, which I, I think answers a second question you'd asked around, you know, what are schools doing and an evaluation of the bill? Sure. Uh, I'm wondering. Is there anybody that has any uh, questions before we move on anything for any reason to pause right now? Otherwise, we'll go ahead. Okay, please go ahead. Thanks. Because I think it will um, address Senator Perchlick's question. And I might go ahead and just share my screen again. Can folks see that? And uh, Jeannie, a, a process question. Someone's in the waiting room. Do you want me to let them in? Uh, Jeannie will take care of that. Thank you, though. I'm just not sure if I have the screen, if she can. That's OK. They, they can. Okay. Yep. OK, so great. Uh, so you know, I, I think a quick scan of available data from fiscal year 20, and, and we would just want to caveat it that it's not exhaustive, we were hustling to get some things together for you in, in a short period of time. Um, and this would require a, a little bit more time to pull together. But in 2018, I believe Martha had done a scan of websites just to take a look at what high schools might be offering when it comes to civics classes. And, and I think it's important to recognize that when we're talking about classes, we're not talking about proficiency-based graduation requirements or proficiencies or standards um, in a, in a student-centered learning state. So I, I believe she found 14 schools require a civics class or credit for graduation and 17 schools offer some variation of a civics class, but it's not required. Uh, a scan of our SECT data. So that's what we pull up through the SLDS for fiscal year 20. And again, this was a very quick scan with using a very rough estimate just based on naming conventions. We found 45% of SU's SDs offer a total of 305 course sections representing approximately at a, at a low end, you know, uh, close to 3,700 students participating in what would be termed you know, a, a civics class. But of note, these are this doesn't include general social study course codes, which is primarily those grades one through eight. So that's not reflected in this data. This primarily reflects 11th and 12th grade course taking. So again, we'd really wanna do a more thorough scan and we could do that and, and come back to the committee if folks were looking for some specific data related to this. But I think, and, and thinking about the technical components of the bill, you know, a survey of classes is not reflective of teaching content and practice in a student-centered learning education system that's personalized, proficiency-based with flexible pathways to graduation. 
And I, I think that's important to note, particularly when we're thinking about what is what what does it appear to be happening in, in the education world and what might actually be happening. Uh, additionally, as Martha's already um, reviewed, Title 16, Section 165 outlines the obligations of the Vermont public schools and CT centers to ensure that students are afforded educational opportunities that are substantially equal in quality. And that is inclusive of the State Board of Education Rule Series 2000, which further explicates the, the above statute and details that each school shall enable students to engage annually in rigorous, relevant, and comprehensive learning opportunities that allows them to demonstrate proficiency in subsection D, global citizenship, which is inclusive of civics, economics, geography, world language, cultural studies, and history concepts. Because our education system is proficiency-based, using terminology consistent with existing statute and rules will be important. And, and an example would be, you know, demonstrating proficiency versus passing grade. By having even a, a language mismatch, you might run into some difficulties and challenges as we're uh, have a, a system that's still engaged in the process of implementing proficiency-based graduation requirements, and, and suddenly we're disrupting that with a different expectation. Currently, for students to graduate, they, they must meet their school's PBGRs. So the PBGRs, which are standards-based and developed in accordance to board rule, standards such as C3, are the foundation for graduation requirements. So in many respects, we have systems in place in which students have to demonstrate mastery competency or in this state proficiency. Um, I think just a, a, an area worthy of reflection in looking at some of the language of the bill, um, particularly uh, section B, the exclusion of special education students or publicly funded students attending private schools could be construed as counter to section 165 as far as affording educational opportunities that are substantially equal to all Vermont children and is counter to or in conflict with IDA's purpose to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free appropriate public education. And certainly in um, you know, December of 2015 with the reauthorization of the Every Student Succeeds Act, you know, Congress's intent was that disability is a, a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate and, and contribute to society. And specifically that our national policy is to ensure equality of opportunity and full participation. And so, perhaps revisiting that section where special education students are excluded would be worthy. Um, finally, mandating courses could contribute to disrupting systems, and in this case, talking about the education system, that I think we can all recognize has already uh, been weathering a pretty profound disruption and further exacerbate equity gaps for student groups. But I think what we can all agree on and what I was hearing is that we all firmly believe in the value of public education system, the importance of civil discourse as well as civil discord, which I really appreciate <laughs> um, people attending to, as well as the importance of preparing our students to be an informed component of our citizenry. So, you know, in thinking about achieving the intent of, of S17, certainly students demonstrating proficiency and meeting proficiency-based graduation requirements shouldn't necessarily be constrained by an organizational structure like a class, because we know that in this state, we, we, uh, our education system is driven by student-centered learning pr principles. We know that interdisciplinary approaches, project-based learning, community-based learning, flexible pathways are all robust avenues to developing proficiency and engendering civic literacy in a manner that's consistent with learning theory, which is you know learning is memory that persists, and that's in addition to courses. So you can offer courses, but students who are engaged in uh, community organizing and work-based learning activities, uh, I'm just thinking about the pages at the, at the State House. Schools are at the intersection of humanity. And I think that's important now more than ever when we think about the events of January 6th, when we think about the global pandemic, health and wellness, mental health, social skills, nutrition and predictable meals, workforce development, academic learning, equity and social justice, you could go on. How we serve and support our students as humans holistically informs them as global citizens who are civically engaged and literate. And that's why we mentioned that the, the role of transferable skills, the role of a portrait of a graduate, the role of the social emotional learning competencies. Again, when we think about civil discourse, it's not just about understanding constitutional pr principles, but it's also about developing those social skills. Uh, I think, um, it's also important to note that engagement strategies can often be in conflict with mandates. And I think a question was raised, what might the response of school systems be? 
and certainly school systems that have been managing a lot, particularly now, and are still in the throes of implementing previous unfunded mandates that to switch up a structure um, may be challenging and may not achieve the goals of S-17. And then finally, I would just say supplement, you know, supporting implementation of existing statute and rule through professional learning, through coherence ma making, through the grant funding that Martha described is really an effective means of achieving stability and positive student outcomes, such as students who are, who have, you know, civic literacy and are engaged in the citizenry. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. Um, so I was very relieved to hear that Senator Perslick's children uh, were educated uh, well in terms of civic education. Uh, is that true throughout the state? Is what's, you know, are we, do we have um, that same robust experience, would you say, in all of our schools? Or, or are there areas that schools that might not be receiving that robust experience um, that Senator Persick's children received? And are there areas that I think in general, I'm just wondering if folks were to look at Vermont and say, are the schools, are we in terms of education doing our part you know, to foster this strong democracy, realizing that there are other, other issues around healthcare, you know, uh, equity, workforce, those kinds of things. But would you both, I, I'm trying to get a sense of how you would assess us and are there things that you would recommend that we might need to do going forward? Yeah, I, I think it's a legitimate question and, and, you know, one would be engaging in hubris if you said yes, sure. because we're a local control street state, right? So there is, by design, variability. Yeah. I think what would be helpful is, is to at, at least be afforded the opportunity to uh, do a, a thoughtful scan, one in which we know that we've got folks who have been engaged in equity literacy work or media literacy work, which, by the way, draws in some of these same principles and concepts. And so to the degree that you would run the risk of saying this school is not doing anything, but because they're doing it and it's, it's couched or phrased or described in a different manner. And so I, I think that that's, that's what we're hoping to do. One, through a sort of quantitative analysis, which is like, how can we pull up from the set codes, do a, an analysis of that, and then get you some better data related to that. But I think also having that opportunity to say, what are all the other things that schools are doing and how they're communicating what it is that they're doing that really gets at this? Because I think we're, we're all in agreement, right? Th I mean, we want to see this happen. What I wouldn't want to see happen is that we, one of the dangers of putting things in a class is that it can become something that you complete or you check off, mm -hmm. right? We know that that was a risk with PLPs. Mm -hmm. as opposed to infusing it through curriculum, interdisciplinary approaches, through the activities, right? The, those extracurricular activities, those after-school spaces, so that students understand that being engaged as a citizen is more than taking a class, but it's an orientation to how you behave in the world. And so, you know, that, that would just be a concern that um, in attempting to be able to measure it more easily, we would lose the richness of those interdisciplinary approaches. I appreciate that. And, and going back to what Senator McCormick, I uh, just want to remind us, I think he gave a sort of a starting point, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a way to have a conversation, a way to dialogue on what is, I think, you know, uh, there are, you know, I think everyone here would agree that um, we do need to foster as much as we can this democracy. And it, it's just going to take, it is going to take a very holistic, approach in our schools and, and in other committees to be working on this kind of thing. Um, so, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Other thoughts? Please, Senator Lyons. Thank you both uh, for all the information. When all this started, I wrote down a little phrase and I said, no, I better not say it, but it really is what you just said, Jess, that is passing a course doesn't build um, internalization and understanding. So, um, and listen, my kids were <laughs> so well educated in, in the system, it was great. Um, and I won't tell you about the first fist fight I got into, so that in third grade, it was related. <laughs> 
but I do, I do, I do want to say that um, we are at a teachable moment. So I think this is very uh, high in people's minds. And it's teachable in two ways. One, we look at what's happening or did happen in Washington, D.C. as a real uh, extreme. And then we look at Vermont, where we had one person standing in front of the state house, and, and, and we don't have the same thing. That, that says something to me about an understanding of civics and um, behavior. So I guess my question for you all is, um, I have a couple questions, but one is, if we were to do anything right now as a legislature to ensure that civics education received its due, what would be your suggestion? How would we, uh, look at your smile. <laughs> we don't have money in this committee. No, <laughs> but, but what would you do? Uh, what would be your uh, suggestion to uh, promote the type of understanding we've been, you've been talking about? Well, two things. I one, I would say I appreciate you giving me the parameters. So I'm taking one thing right off, off the table. Um, and, and two, I would say uh, I hope we, we can offer some suggestions now, but uh, I know I would appreciate being able to go back and do some more thinking because it's such a great question. I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to uh, add some things. But I, I do think that programs like We the People mm -hmm. are a way because it's not just about delivery of content, because you can have students take, I, I took a civics course, you can take that course, but if you're not engaged, right, if you don't feel tied to it, it, it you, you're not internalizing, you're not consolidating. And I think activities like We the People in which you have intergenerational, you know, exposure and kids are, you know, within contexts that are, are real and genuine and excite them, those are really, you know, unparalleled opportunities to engage students and, and create that consolidation and have them continue to be engaged and wanting to have those conversations even outside of some sort of formal process. I think, you know, also bringing together and elevating, and these are things that, while they don't require a lot of money, may require some money, but pulling, pulling together educators too so that they can share principles mm -hmm. and also connect each other students. I, COVID and, and the global pandemic has certainly rocked all of us to our core, but it has also surfaced opportunities. The fact that I think people have actually internalized using education technology more in the classroom provides opportunities where schools can connect virtually, different classrooms can connect and have those debates and start to interact because we know that part of learning is also a, a pro-social process and that the socialization piece really informs and uh, expands the learning opportunity and the you know internalization of those discipline and those concepts. Um, I, I, I'm going to hog this. I'm not going to hog it. I'm going to demonstrate some self-control and I'm going to turn over to Martha because I know that Martha has some ideas. <laughs> Martha, uh, we're having- You're, you're muted. We're finding that sometimes people, there you go. Okay. There you are. Um, well, I, I, I can't help but reiterate um, Jess's sort of uh, talking about the We the People program. It, I mean, I've been involved with it in um, North Carolina. I've been asked to participate in the national finals. My students hated me when I asked them to do it, um, asked them to participate. And then Three months later in the yearbook, when they were asked about their favorite things in school, what are they writing about? We the people. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity for now North Carolina Supreme Court Justice, who was so amazed that I competed with sophomores against all the other schools in North Carolina that had seniors and juniors. He was so amazed that he actually came and you know did a just hung out in, in, at our school just to meet the kids and see what was happening in a you know super uh, 2000 student high school in urban in an urban area refugee school where a program can so inspire kids um, to civic action i mean some of the things that happened in our school happened because of this program i mean I, you've seen my 
former school in the news for really cool things that happened within the Charlotte community. So that's a small plug for that. I think- um, I'll Just to interrupt quickly, if you don't mind. Is We the People, is that a sort of a curriculum that you can use through the entire class or is it more of a competition? Can you say briefly, remind me? Yeah, I mean, they start with the philosophical foundations of our country and they it's bring it all the lot, way to current day. There's six units. It's, a, it's both. It's a curriculum. It's all students. It, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And and then the kids have the opportunity of participating in a congressional hearing. Um, and that that's what makes it super cool, bringing the community together to see the learning that happened with these kids and the fact that you know they have the hardest part is the six minutes of the impromptu questions. Sure. <laughs> but uh, the, one of the other things uh, that I was going to say. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I just want to ask how it compares with girl state and boy state in terms of their experience that they get when they come into the state house. Um, I have to defer because I'm okay. not really don't, familiar. Don't I, sorry. I've only been here for four years. I'm, I'm oh, not familiar. <laughs> sorry. And, and I, I'm not, I, I don't have expertise in that, but I, I do think that uh, as we just said, we as a people is for all students. So it, it's not a competitive process. You know, you're, you're not selected. I, I believe boys state and girls state, uh, it's, yes. it's not open to all, right? You'd have to apply. Right. Okay, that, that is a huge difference then because all students within the class participate. And that's a real important um, piece of this because I had, you know, my special education students that were in my class participated in We the People. And, and the collaboration and the relationships that were developed because of being on a team with kids that you probably would never have spoken to mm -hmm. um, was what really makes it a powerful prog program. Uh, Senator Hooker and then Senator Chittenden. So, so thank you, Martha and, and Jess. I'm, I'm impressed with everything that um, you've said and the opportunities that are afforded, especially for pro, um, professional development for teachers. Um, and with regard to We the People, it sounds like a course. It sounds like a course to me. And I mean, I know I, was, I participated when I was teaching. Um, I was, uh, went to Yale with a group of kids from Model UN. But, you know, they did, you know, they worked throughout the year to come up with their um, presentations and uh, then they competed down in Connecticut. But it was just, in that case, it was just kids who chose to do it. But Martha, from what I'm hearing, are all your sophomores expected to take this course? And then whomever is, is um, has a desire can go on to the competition. Is that what I'm understanding? No, the whole class um, goes on to the competition. That was one of the things that really drew me to it. Um, and yes, it could be a course. I did it. I, I infused it in my North Carolina state sophomore required civics and econ class, but I also was able to utilize it with my student Congress, which is, I guess, what you would call student government. Um, um, so that that was with 11th and 12th graders. But um, yeah, I mean, I think Poultney, I don't know that it was a specific civics class that she had in, in Poultney. And I don't think Williamstown did either. I think St. Johnsbury was a class yeah, and I, and I think what we're highlighting is we provided grant funding to allow for some of those schools to participate in the in the competition and pay for them having the experience. And so I think continue to provide that kind of support. It is a class. I think what we would be looking for is, uh, and, and people, there are classes, there's programs of study and course catalogs in, in all of our schools, but what we wouldn't want to, uh, you know, impinge is the ability for you know, a student who participates in boys or girls state to also demonstrate proficiency um, through that extended learning opportunity or experience. It, well, and that my, I guess the, the driving question that I have is, um, are all of the kids going to get the opportunities? And I think uh, Senator Campion asked that about schools, but I'm thinking in a school, 
will all of the kids have the opportunity to have at least some um, connection and some exposure to uh, what government is, what what um, social responsibility means. And I, I appreciate just that you're saying infusing it across the curriculum. And I think that that's the way to do it. And I don't think that it should be one class that you take and you get a grade on and that's, you know, that um, satisfies your responsibility, but are your requirement. But I do wonder um, without having some kind of guidance or, or um, program, uh, are all of the kids going to be able to have the advantage of learning about democracy? Yeah, um, it's a great uh, Martha? Um, I just wanted to clarify, all of the students are in a class. When I said it wasn't a class, it wasn't, I don't think that they were specifically civics classes. Um, they were a cohesive class on the teacher's roster. Um, not to belabor the we the people point, but you know, we put out, the agency put out a grant for schools, um, any schools to participate, and they would be able to have um, competitions within the schools if more than one group wanted to do it. And then that's how we ended up with, you know, we had three from the state decide, normally you only get one um, representative school to go to nationals, but we were selected um, with a wild card to be able to send two. Um, and going back to a, a, the original question about suggestions, and I think whomever asked, you, you asked, I think specifically, how could we help promote? And I think that is sort of key to this. And I guess it's just because, you know, this is my thing. And I get so frustrated when I um, hear about, um, you know, I see the commercials on TV for, for, you know, I couldn't go anywhere without math and science. And, and you know, you can't get anywhere without civic education. So I just think the, the just the fact that we're having this conversation is really important and it helps elevate the importance of civic education. So more conversations and more people involved in sharing this, I think is super important. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your passion for this. I really do. And I appreciate also your willingness to take some more time um, and, and, and come back to us with that, with, you know, again, what is it that you all believe, you know, after connecting with folks even more on the ground, what are the kinds of things that you need from us and what kinds of things can we be doing as a legislature to, to foster again, this education, educating people for democracy. I, I do want to be respectful to our next witnesses. Senator Chittenden, didn't you have a, a closing question? Really quick, I just want to say just two things you said go echo my original concern, which is the line 15 referring to a passing grade might not be the right kind of language uh, when we need to have proficiencies and then item B regarding special education. So I don't know if there are precedent for setting standards or curricular specifics through a legislative act like this, but um, with this current language, I'd really want somebody like Jess saying this is the language that's going to fit best with Department of Education standards and how we can steer and guide curriculum. So those are my pauses and thank you for the presentation. Absolutely, and that's, that, those are great uh, closing points. So if the two of you uh, would be willing to, again, um, come back to us, take some time. Uh, you know, we're taking this afternoon, as you know, to, to just broadly look at this topic. Um, we have the Snelling Center uh, in the waiting room and they're going to be joining us. And then we have two other witnesses just to, again, be asking ourselves across the board, what are we doing? What can we be doing? to foster democracy in, in, in Vermont, uh, in this country, uh, in our schools, et cetera. So if you don't mind, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, great seeing both of you again. You I appreciate your partnership and your passion for this. And uh, you know how to reach us and we'll, we'll be in touch and let's find some time to have you come back in after you've had an opportunity to assess and really look at what your needs are. Great, thank thanks you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Great. I see our next uh, two witnesses, uh, Mr. Snelling. Great to see you. Good afternoon. And, good afternoon. And is it, is it pronounced Mr. Freed? Yes, Charity Freed. Yeah. Thanks for having us, uh, Mr. Snelling. Uh, probably needs no introduction, but I will give him one. He's Diane Snelling's brother. 
<laughs> There's a, that's true. <laughs> uh, we many of us uh, were have served with Senator Snelling over the years and are big fans of hers. So, uh, uh, Mark, it's great having you here as well as you, Jody. Uh, you know we are looking at civic education, educating for democracy this afternoon. Uh, we just heard from uh, the Agency of Education around some of the things they're doing. And we thought it would be important to hear from the Snelling Center uh, around the kinds of things that you're all doing, uh, either in our schools, out of our schools, for legislators, for adults, uh, around this issue. So with that, I'll turn it over to the two of you. And, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, delightful to see you all here today, um, all in your habitats. <laughs> I, had a, I had a screen background but I realized just before I came on that it was of the house and that that probably would not go over well in, in the red carpet room. So I, I decided against that and went with the state flag. Um, but I'm uh, delighted to be here. You know, I, I spent about a half an hour listening to your previous testimony and um, you know, we're really involved in a very different animal than what you're specifically discussing. And, um, Hopefully there's some insights and some pieces of that that will uh, blend over for you uh, as you look at S17. But we don't really work with students. Um, we work with adults. And so it's a different animal. Uh, the Snelling Center was founded in 1992 um, as a memorial to my father. Later, later added my mother's name to it. And it would, the idea was instead of naming a bridge or a building or a road after him, that we would try to espouse some of the principles that he felt were really important and that he learned in his work. And the mission of the Snelling Center is to foster responsible and ethical civic leadership, encourage public service by private citizens and promote informed citizen participation in shaping public policy in Vermont. So it's very much what you're talking about and trying to apply to students, uh, primarily I gather in high school. Um, so we're sort of a different animal, but working the same side of the street with people that are a little bit older. Um, we have over a thousand graduates. Um, I'm proud to say that I live in Addison County and have for 43 years. Both of my senators are graduates of one of our programs. Uh, Suzanne Young, the Secretary of Administration, is a graduate of our one of our programs. Uh, Dan French, the Secretary of the Agency of Education, is a graduate of one of our programs, along with, I don't know, 14 or 15 other members of the legislature. So uh, we have three core programs. One is the Vermont Leadership Institute, and you'll hear from Jody in a little bit, but Jody is the director of that program. That's for a general program, uh, serves business people, nonprofit, um, it, it really a, a wide range of people, government employees, um, and so on. Um, we also have the Vermont School Leadership Project, and that serves primarily principals and superintendents of schools. And almost every school in Vermont has someone that has gone through the Vermont School Leadership Project. We also have done uh, five years of an early childhood leadership institute, which takes people involved in the early childhood area and gives them some of the same kinds of training that we do in the other programs. Our programs tend to be uh, almost exclusively overnight retreats where people are able to get away from their normal day-to-day. -day. And I would suggest that, um, and when thinking about S17, that one of the core pieces that I've learned after 11 years of being the volunteer president of the Stelling Center is that our participants are away from their normal routines. They don't have cell phones with them. They don't have contact. And they feel as though they're in a safe space. 
and being in a safe space enables them to look carefully at who they are and how they want to engage uh, in civic participation and leadership work. Uh, most of our programs run six to eight or nine sessions. So they're weekend sessions um, where people primarily, you, know, you have two eight hour days, but you're learning a lot from the people that you're with, the, the friendships, the bonds, the camaraderie. Uh, and if I were looking back at S17, I would say one of the core pieces has to be finding a way to provide a different feeling than students have all day long as they run around from class to class, that the safe space feeling to try and figure out who you are, how you interact, how you might engage more in uh, the civics of your area, that's a challenge. It's a very tough challenge. It's easier for us to do. One of the other things is we, we look at an arc of leadership. And that arc of leadership really starts out saying, who are you? You know, you we do 360 reviews where people, I don't know what the number is, 10 or 15 of your colleagues, some that work for you, some that you work for, review you and, and speak to your skills, your approach and how you uh, interact with them and so on, so that you can learn that feedback. We then go on to, to uh, talk more about uh, one whole session is called Know Thyself, um, so that people focus on who they are. We then go on to talk about core values of your organization and of individuals, so that you can try and elevate what's important to you. We then look at systems work. What, you know, we come to Montpelier and, and talk about how the systems uh, of government work. And a number of you have participated in that in the past, and we hope in the future you'll be able to again uh, when the world opens up a little bit. But all of those pieces to the puzzle are, are an arc of leadership as someone comes to know themselves, know how the system works, and see how they can get engaged. And so for S17, trying to find a way that students can find a spot to get engaged and feel comfortable doing it, it, it I think is a key. And I, my, my prejudice is that it's hard to be a class in our school system, but that's um, um, uh, one of the other pieces that, I, that sort of has been core for me over the years is we don't try and teach everything there is about leadership. One could not do that. And so almost every uh, class is reminded that there are nibbles and nuggets and that we try to give them little pieces that as res responsible adults, they can go on and dig into further with the world of the internet that exists today. Um, if you have a little nibble or a nugget, you can go dig it out um, for yourself. Um, I want to uh, introduce Jody Freed, who is uh, the director of our Vermont Leadership Institute, uh, has been doing it for a couple of years. He also sidelines as the executive director of Catamount Arts. Uh, so he has an arts background, a business background, and a leadership background. And I'm delighted to have him uh, with us today. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for uh, inviting me to join. Um, you know, I, as I looked through the uh, S17 and as I, I, I thought about um, the, the lenses that I could bring perhaps to your discussion, a, a couple of key things come to mind. One is dealing with the age group that you're dealing with at high school, um, which I believe is where this is intended. I think the key is gonna be engagement. Um, and finding a program um, or, figure outing, or figuring out a way to keep the kids engaged, which is part of what Mark was talking about. And in, in, in our world with the adults, we're able to pop people out and bring them to remote locations and shut off all their phones and create isolation and create a bubble. Um, I don't know that that's gonna be realistic in public schools, um, but 
there, there might be some strategies that could be brought to bear there. Um, I, I've seen programs, and, and this relates directly to some of the art stuff that we've worked with over the years, um, where there's mock trials, um, there's mock build creation, um, there's actually putting the students into the different roles and allowing them to essentially fulfill the different roles of government or civic positions um, it, where their voice is actually heard and they learn what those roles are and they actually act those out. And I think those are very effective. Um, my son is actually at UVM and he's part of the mock trial club right now at UVM. And it's incredible um, how much they're learning through that process um, in terms of the legal system. And, and I've seen programs in different um, high schools um, where they've done similar things um, uh, where again, you're actually, rather than just doing just textbook instruction or a um, download of information to students, you're actually engaging them in the process. Um, and then maybe that could be culminated with, um, in this day and age, um, you know, video conferences with people who are actually doing this work, um, maybe people on this committee. Uh, it, it could be um, culminated with actually attending town meeting and having assignments or perhaps the, you know, different teams of the students could then go out and engage directly within their town or their local community. So that engagement piece and giving voice I think is going to be key to this age group. Um, and I, Mark and I have had a lot of conversations about the fact that what's, what we feel is, is missing in Vermont that this could really help create is the pipeline to programs like the Vermont Leadership um, and getting people started earlier, um, allowing them in their local communities to then engage and perhaps um, having some um, leadership training at a um, civic or municipal level um, that could then create the next level um, of uh, Vermont Leadership Institute or similar programs at the higher level, which then could um, work towards folks that would go on to serve in the legislature. Um, and, and so you could create a, a pathway for people who um, everybody could engage at the level where they feel comfortable um, and they could learn what those levels are and there could be different stages in that. So I think that this is, I think what you're doing is really important because if we don't start this with the, um, at the younger ages, um, to think that it's just gonna start on its own as, as we move up um, the age bracket, um, I think we're, we're gonna completely miss the boat. Um, and so, um, I, the only other thing I would bring up is just the one of the biggest focuses in leadership training right now, as it relates to civics, is around the interconnectivity and the complexity um, of the world that we're living in. Um, and I think that that's a really important piece of this that it, it can be demonstrated through exercises, again, and learned experience. Um, rather than just um, to talking about it through a textbook instruction. So having a business person talk about how, you know, what takes place um, in Montpelier affects their business and having a business person um, talk to the high school students, um, having one of the educators talk about the impact, um, but it, it, relating the complexity across sectors because I think the kids will really get that and it will resonate and it will then become more relevant to them than just the, um, the again, categorizing folks as either being involved with politics or not. So those are my thoughts um, in, in terms of ha having looked at what you guys are working on and um, how it would relate to our program and just generally thinking. One other just quick note is we are participating Catamount Arts right now in the um, Why It Matters Civics and Electoral Participation Program through the Vermont Humanities Council. The Vermont Humanities Council received a $50,000 grant from the Mellon Foundation, which gave out a million dollars in grants across the country. And between now and May, 
these programs are running all across the country to engage um, in civic participation. Um, and I just, I wonder, given that that pathway has already started, that this kind of a conversation, um, picking that up with the Mellon Foundation could be an interesting, um, and speaking with Christopher at the um, uh, Vermont Humanities Council, who happens to be a VLI graduate, um, it might be a really um, a nice place to find some alignment in what's being talked about right now. I might also add um, to Jody's statements that for 26 years, um, and I've done the historical study, we have included a piece on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we started with about an hour of 26 years ago out of um, nine weekends. It was about an hour. Over the last seven or eight years, we've done an entire two-day session on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the last three years, we have woven a thread. We've continued that two-day session, but we've also woven a thread through the entire program so that that is a core piece of going through our Vermont Leadership Institute. And I think in Vermont, as we look forward to civic participation, uh, that that absolutely has to be a core piece of anything that's being done is for people to come to understand the diversity and the benefits of diversity that can be in Vermont's future. So I would just add that as a piece of looking at S-17 and saying that's an important thread to weave in there. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. And it is very, very rewarding. We refer that's to it as being we know. part of our core DNA now, that it's a part of everything we do. And we look through that DEI lens as we address every single subject, as we get people go through the VLI experience. Committee, questions? Please, Senator Chinden. I just wanna say, I try not to live my, I try to live my life without regrets. One regret I have is not going through VLI. I have some great friends that have gone through. They speak very highly of it. They tried to get me in, in a previous class, but I just couldn't squeeze it in. But I know you do great work and the alumni of your network are a testament to how, how great of a program you have. So thanks for testifying today. Thank is you, it, Senator. Is it possible, and I'm not sure if this is for you, Mr. Freed or Mr. Snelling, are there ways for you to engage high school students? Are there ways, are you engaging high school students in, in any way at this point? Would it take state funding? I'm, you know, I'm just curious, it seems as Mr. Freed mentioned, there's sort of this possibility to cultivate this next group of uh, SI uh, graduates, et cetera. And I, I'm wondering if there are partnerships with our high schools that might make sense. I would I would suggest that it's certainly possible. It's a it's a you know uh, technically possible, mm -hmm. financially you know the world that we live in is scraping for every penny yeah. as a as a nonprofit mm -hmm. this year in particular. Um, that um, our programs are not cheap, and we have um, really ended up, uh, particularly as we've wanted to continue the program and to make sure that as we look at diversity, equity, inclusion, that we don't have finance as a method of selecting, um, that we end up with a tremendous amount of scholarship uh, that has to be applied in order to continue the program. So I think it's really a fi financial question, Senator. Okay, thank you. I, I would just chime in that one possibility, um, which also would require some financial for the administration, some support, but, we do have a huge network that Mark mentioned of 1,000 people. And so as you move through here, there's a possibility that there could be mentor, mentorship programs set up um, as individuals got identified where we could find members of the our large network of graduates who are involved um, in civic leadership who could then mentor high school age kids um, and that would be an interesting program to explore. I'm guessing we would have a high response rate within our, our thousand plus network. Um, and for those students that identify themselves as being interested across the state, that would be something to explore. Great, 
Good idea, Jody. It is. It's yeah. It, I like that. It, it, it's it's an excellent idea. You know, how do you get you know young people to select boards uh, in the legislature? You know, having a role, starting their own projects and initiatives in their communities. These are all great ideas, and, and I think we all, as elected officials, have to ask ourselves. You know, even in as we're doing this, how did what was the fire in our belly to get us to where we are at? You know, to run, to participate. What are those kinds of things, and are they are there things that we just experienced growing up? And are there ways to instill them in in young people today? Uh, Senator Hooker, you have a question. Well, I'm just um, thinking that Senator Lyons talked, I think, alluded to you know the moment and what uh, this discussion is being um, surrounded by, really. And I think that we have to continue to talk about the, um, you know, what we are and who we are. And I'm certainly um, glad to hear that, you know, the education is ongoing with adults. I always feel that education is a lifelong experience. And, um, you know, just to make sure that our kids have exposure to various aspects of government and society so that we can make well-rounded citizens of them. And Senator Chittenden, there's probably time for you to take a course. I think, I think there's absolutely. I see a Senate Education Scholarship being formed soon. <laughs> Glad to do it, just need to fit it into my schedule. We, we have had our youngest participant in our Vermont Leadership Institute was 23. And um, she worked in on Church Street and she was, um, you know, a new uh, Vermonter, a new American. And she uh, walked up and down the street and solicited businesses to fund her to go to uh, VLI. Um, and our oldest participant was 77 years old. And so um, all of those people then go out into back into their world and make hopefully greater contributions because they have improved their skill set. You know, I know we have, and uh, I'm meeting uh, with uh, the folks from Governor's Institute around some other things, but, you know, this could, you know, is there a way to either involve our Governor's Institutes or have all of you in a way bring, you know, lower the, the, the outreach uh, in terms of age to do a high school program at a different cost, at a different, you know, a different kind of, of uh, you know, experience, just again, something to, to think about. Um, Senator Lyons. She is silent. I'm good. I, you know, I'm having, uh, I completely agree with the need for extracurricular experiences that take people out into the real world and uh, collaborate with mentors or um, other folks to, uh, to learn uh, and to really practice what they're learning. I think it's just great. I do, actually, I do have a question. Um, so one of the things that I, get, I have been fully engaged in are free trade ag agreements and the global changes that we're seeing. And honestly, this state has so many businesses that are also similarly engaged. I, I just am wondering whether you look at do any kind of a sort of leadership analysis of what's going on in our local democracy as compared with the effects of free trade agreements on uh, decision making? Because I mean, it's a huge area, but I don't know whether that is something that you incorporate in your thinking or not. No, that's my other job. <laughs> Good. I, I run a business that, that, that feeds me. And what I do is I import copper and brass from Peru. Um, and so that's, uh, that's my uh, feeding mechanism. But no, uh, we don't, Senator. Uh, okay. it, it, more focused on the individual and the engagement of that individual. Um, Terrific. And, and thank you. And thanks for your, um, for your good work. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Senator Hooker, did you have a final question? Just a, a comment that Please. I think in the times that we're living, we've seen young people um, rise to the occasion. And I don't know if it's because of you know social media. I mean, it's certainly a lot easier for kids to be involved now. Um, it, last night, I, I saw a young child, really. I don't think she was more than 10 or 11 years old who had started a program uh, to gather things to give to people who were in need. And she um, started it online and solicited um, products. And and it's a, a countrywide, a national thing now. And it was, you know, it's amazing what kids can do. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I just as far as S17 goes, in my estimation or in my um, desire for it, it's a desire to help our kids learn from a young age what our country is about, what democracy is, and how we can fit into you know, the global scene. And, and I'm beginning to see it as more, as we speak to people like Mr. Snelling and Mr. Freed um, and, and the women from the Department of Education, I'm beginning to see it more like um, basketball players as opposed to kids taking phys ed. So we want everybody to take phys ed and become, you know, be physically fit. But there are a segment of those kids that are going to go on to do more. And these programs that are are run by people like you are um, the programs that are allowing people to really advance in you know, the understanding of democracy. But phys ed gives everybody a basic understanding of you know, the needs of the body. It's interesting. I, I was just thinking to myself, we had a, you know, a, a busload of Vermonters that went down to DC two weeks ago. It, it, you know, I, it's probably not even possible, but you know, to interview, to talk, to say, you know, why, to kind of, you know, again, I'm not, I don't believe a, a course will fix or have prevented that kind of thing, but, um, but it, it, it is a, it is, it, it is, it does weigh on me, you know, it does weigh, you know, how can we, as Senator Hooker said, um, get people to really understand this country, its history, uh, how remarkable much of it is, and um, and to kind of and to treasure that, and and to, and to again foster good democratic values. One might suggest Please. that some of the people on that bus were engaged, and yes, with the, uh, yes. and that depending on their actions and their motives uh, in going. We might applaud that as a good thing, as we um, did the various marches over the last 50 years for civil rights or for women's rights, any of those kinds of things. We want people to care. We do want them to stand with their flags. We don't want them breaking into buildings. And right. um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a line there that is a pretty clear line. And uh, we, we want people to care. And it is you know, a piece of the action. And that is part of what our programs, I think, help people to understand is the connection they individually have mm. to changing the world to make it a better place. And the skills that they need to bring to bear on the systems and the changes that are needed, both in Vermont and um, countrywide, to make it a fairer, more equitable place to live. I'll just chime in back to that intersectionality piece because I think it's so important. If you have the kid living in my neck of the woods in the Northeast Kingdom that's grown up on the farm, um, you know, working on the dairy farm, then having somebody who is participating in government that is coming from that same background is going to resonate with that person and, and with that child. And so Again, figuring out ways um, where you you meet and you provide multiple opportunities to meet the kids where they are at in their lives from so they can find their unique voice and where they can then engage because that's, you know, 
we call it spark at VLI. Where do you find that spark and that, that energy that allows you to, to carry forward? And, and that's the first step in the process. And you're not gonna find that in a textbook. And, and not that the textbook part isn't important and that the basic understanding is important to give some competency. But if you're looking for spark and looking for getting people involved and increasing civic participation, that's going to be the key component in my opinion. Thank you both for joining us. A terrific conversation. Uh, and if you do have additional thoughts or additional ideas, of course, we'll welcome you back. Um, but uh, we, I'm afraid, need to leave it there for now. Thank you all very much. Very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for all you do. Thanks. Uh, we are going to uh, take a 10 minute break. Uh, if we could uh, just mute and uh, close our videos and look forward to seeing all of you at 345. I mean, sorry, 330. Seeing that it's 330, we should get started again. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Sargrad. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Scott? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sargrad is uh, with the Center for American Progress. I uh, reached out to him after reading some of his work and thought that he too might be helpful as we have this afternoon's discussion around educating for democracy, uh, looking at not only what's in our schools in terms of possibilities, but what external things uh, we might be looking at. And just kind of, again, as I think the direction we're moving in, is just seeing what's out there. What are the possibilities? What are some of the things that we as the education committee can be doing? What other committees might be considering? What we as a state might be considering? So, so I very much appreciate uh, Mr. Sargrad joining us. And I believe he's joining us from the Southern part of the United States, at least Southern for Vermonters. I believe he's in Maryland. That's right, right outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Right. So Mr. Sargrad, if you don't mind, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Uh, I sent Mr. Sargrad a copy of the bill that we've reviewed, um, looking for his just general thoughts uh, in terms of uh, to, you know, educating for democracy. But first, I thought we'd hear a little bit about who he is and the kind of work he does. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to come speak with you. I really appreciate the chance to share some of our thinking at CAP, and it's exciting to see the work that you all are doing in Vermont on improving civics education. Obviously a key priority and also obviously good timing after the inauguration of the new president yesterday. So the civics lesson yesterday for, for all of us. Um, but again, I'm Scott Sargrad. I'm the vice president for K-12 education policy at the Center for American Progress. Uh, we're a nonpartisan multi-issue think tank and advocacy organization that's based in Washington, D.C., and we cover a whole range of issues, uh, but I lead our K-12 education work. Um, so I've got some things I'm, I'm happy to cover if that is uh, helpful, Senators, and, and then happy to uh, have a discussion and answer any questions that you all have. And That's great. Were, great. Um, so there are a few things that I was kind of hoping to cover in some of my remarks today. Um, one is to talk a little bit about the importance of civics education and some of the current challenges that uh, we see nationwide. And so I'm sure some of these are familiar to you all in Vermont as well. Uh, talk a little bit about the framework that we have developed on what we think a kind of robust civics education can look like, both from a policy standpoint and from a classroom standpoint. Uh, talk a little bit about the our analysis of the current state of civics education and civics requirements nationwide, and then a few additional strategies that we've seen as effective. And again, as Senator Kempe, you mentioned kind of going beyond the classroom a little bit and beyond some of the traditional approaches to civics education. I think there are a few things that are worth considering as you're talking about a broader view of uh, educating for, for democracy. Uh, and just as a little more background myself, uh, I started as a, a classroom teacher. I spent a few years as a special ed paraprofessional and also as a high school and middle school math teacher. So while not a civics or history teacher, I uh, do bring some of my experience as a, a math teacher and a special ed paraprofessional to the, the research and the work that I'm doing. Uh, so 
Just to start off, I mean, as you all well know, uh, civics education is a key part of the school's role in equipping students for college career and civic life. And I think that civic life is important and sometimes lost in our discussions about preparation for college and the future workforce. And obviously civics education provides students with a critical opportunity to participate in their democracy, which uh, is just as important as any of these other aspects of schooling. Uh, and ideally what civics education needs to do is to help students cultivate that civic knowledge, their skills and their dispositions. And this is both uh, sort of what we talk about is civic literacy and civic engagement. And I think usually civic literacy is what kind of historically we all have thought of as civics class. So constitution, bill of rights, branches of government, things like that. Uh, but then civics engage civic engagement is a little bit broader and think about things like political activism, community service, national service, volunteering, service learning, those different kinds of engagement that are also important to have a robust civic life. So uh, a few of the challenges that we've identified nationwide, and again, um, like I mentioned, some of these are likely familiar to you all. Uh, there's a broad lack of resources for education generally and for civics education specifically. The federal and state funding overall is de declined for civics education over time. Uh, we've got low achievement and outcomes in terms of civic knowledge. Uh, since the late 90s, the test scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress civics exam have shown that uh, less than a quarter of students are actually proficient in civics uh, as measured by that exam. And there are, just as in other subjects, disproportionate score gaps between Black and Latino students and white students, uh, between English language learners and their native speaking peers, between lower income students and higher income students, and students with disabilities and students without disabilities. And there's also opportunity gaps in civic engagement, not just in you know, civic knowledge, uh, yeah, between Black and Latino students and white students and, and others. Uh, we know that white youth are twice as likely as African-American youth and three times as likely as Latino youth to contact a public official. And students from families with low incomes are 30% less likely to report having experiences with debates or panel discussions in their social studies classes. So there are some clear opportunity gaps that face some of our children and things that we need to address as educators, as public officials. Uh, and what this has meant is that for communities of color and communities with lower incomes, this disproportionate exclusion from civics education, as well as other structural barriers uh, can lead to lower civic participation. And that then continues a cycle where officials in public offices are then less likely to actually fight for the needs of those communities. So having looked at some of these barriers and some of the challenges uh, and some of the research on civics education, our view on what a robust approach looks like includes a couple of different factors. So in the research that we've done, we've examined state civics requirements based on a few components. Uh, so one is, whether states have required a civics or a US government course. And so that's I think the, the focus of the bill that you all are, are thinking about is this idea of a specific course for graduation on, uh, civics, on civics. The second piece is what's the minimum number of required credits for civics. And that does actually vary from uh, nothing to a half a credit one semester course, a full year, even one and a half credits in, uh, in one state. And then we look at whether st states require students to complete community service as part of their graduation requirements, again, as part of the uh, civic engagement piece. Uh, then if states require students to take a civics exam as part of their graduation requirements. And then finally, whether the civics and government courses include key elements of a rigorous and robust curriculum. And just a little more specifically on this last point, which I, I think is important at the curriculum or course content level, we think there are five key elements that should be included in course materials, in state standards, um, in civics education. And those five are, one is an explanation or a comparison of democracy. Uh, two is the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Three is public participation. Uh, four is information on state and local voting rules. And then five is media literacy and the role and influence of media. And I think those first two are, again, usually what we might think of as a typical uh, part of a civics uh, course. Sure. So would you mind repeating those? Sure. We have them, please. Go ahead. Um, 
And this is also, I'll share the link to the report that we've okay. done on this. Um, I can drop that in the chat at, at some point. Right. Uh, I can do that right now, actually. And that has the, the full analysis and right. the description of all of these. Um, but those in those sort of five elements are uh, an explanation or comparison of democracy, the US Constitution and Bill of Rights, public participation, information on state and local voting rules, and media literacy and the role and influence of media. And again, sort of those first two are things that we typically consider part as a, of a civics course. That's kind of the civic literacy part in a lot of ways. And our view is that the other three components are also critical. And it's important to, again, take this broader view of civics that's not just the facts of um, civic ed civics education, but also this broader piece of engagement. And so just a, a quick overview, and I think this is probably useful for you all as you're considering what to do in Vermont, but of the, the national picture on this. Uh, so thinking about some of our core elements of this uh, robust civics education, there are 39 states plus the District of Columbia that require at least a semester's worth of standalone civics courses. and Eight states and DC require a full year and Hawaii is the state that requires actually one and a half credits of civics education for graduation. Uh, 20 states require some sort of civics exam. 26 states have this, these five elements of a robust curriculum. And uh, then there are, are another 12 states that are at four of those five elements. And interestingly, the, this media literacy standard, which is, we've done a couple of these types of analyses. This is a new standard that we added given uh, what we've seen in the past few years about the role of media. And there are actually 33 states that address that as part of their uh, civics or government requirements, which we thought was, was interesting and promising. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are 23 states that offer some type of credit for community service, although only Maryland and DC actually mandate community service as part of their graduation requirements. So we get some, some things to think about uh, for Vermont. Uh, and then again, beyond some of these key elements, there are some specific strategies that you all might wanna think about at the state level and also um, might be worth uh, providing information to some of your school districts and schools uh, as you're thinking about this effort to improve civic education, civic literacy and civic engagement. And uh, one state to actually think about as an example uh, happens to be Maryland, coincidentally, even though this is where I live and uh, where my son is in kindergarten. Uh, but they've done a, quite a nice job uh, historically of thinking about all these different elements. So uh, they have civics standards that are codified in their social studies standards all the way from pre-K through 12th grade. So they don't just have kind of a standalone course, but they have determined how to incorporate civics education throughout social studies and, and again, not just in high school when we typically think of civics, but all the way down to, to pre-K. Uh, they also have the required civics course and other graduation requirements. So students have to take at least one year of civics or government. They have to complete 75 hours of community service. They have to pass the Maryland High School Assessment in American government. And then they also have service learning requirements as part of their high school graduation. And the other thing that's really interesting about Maryland is they were, they really focused quite a bit on civic engagement and voter participation. So they were one of the first states in the country to pre-register 16 and 17 year olds to vote. So that teenagers are definitely eligible to cast a ballot when they reach 18. And, and interestingly, a few cities in Maryland actually allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in local elections. So they've really leaned in on this sort of participation, voter engagement, youth engagement uh, in the political process. And there are a couple of other strategies that I, I wanted to highlight around civic engagement as well. Uh, so one is at the of student level and thinking about what uh, students and teachers can do together. There's something that's called youth participatory action research, uh, which is a, a form of research uh, where teachers and community members help to train students to develop research questions based around a particular issue in their schools or in their communities. And the students conduct research, they do interviews, data collection, they analyze the results and develop specific solutions for this kind of policy problem. 
and then they take that information and they advocate for the solutions to decision-making bodies. So that might be school administrators, it might be local policymakers, it might be state officials. And it's a way to really engage students in all aspects of that kind of public policy process. And it's been particularly effective for students of color and for other traditionally marginalized communities, so like students who identify as LGBTQ. Uh, another interesting strategy is more at the school level and thinking about this idea of news and media literacy education. And this uh, idea of news and media literacy are really important given that students could be inundated with unreliable information from social media, from the internet, and that hurts their ability to effectively engage in key issues when they don't have uh, the right information or they're not sure what the right information is. And, and this these components of news literacy have shown pretty good potential to increase not just knowledge about current events, but uh, political efficacy for students and cultivate positive student relationships with, with uh, civic life. And one state that's done some interesting work here is California, and they have legislation that requires the state education department there to offer school districts a list of online media literacy resources, have instructional materials, and professional development programs for teachers. So it's a, an interesting approach where the state provides this information and, and then helps the local school districts, the teachers make use of the professional development resources. And then the last piece I'll highlight is been thinking a little bit at the national level and at the state level as well is how to cultivate civic engagement through increasing voter registration and participation. Again, voting is one of the core elements of civic engagement and, and states like Virginia have things like high school voter registration challenges where high schools compete to register the largest percentage of voting age students and in Virginia they get a certificate from the governor uh, if they have the, the greatest percentage. Uh, there are some companies that have done a really nice job on this too, with large audiences of young people. And so like Snapchat actually added links for voter registration and users profiles and sent reminders and it led to more than 400,000 new voter registrations. So there's some interesting ways that I think at the state level, you all could be highlighting um, voter registration, uh, youth engagement, and things like that through a number of different uh, different means. So uh, I would say it's just, it's really exciting, like I said before, to see more interest in civics education and civics literacy, civic engagement. Um, and it's really important to think about this as part of school's broader mission to prepare students for not just college and career, but civic life and engagement in democracy. And so we want students to understand some of these foundations of democracy and the core principles of American government that is foundational, but also to have the knowledge and experience needed to participate as full and active citizens. And so I'm yeah, really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you and, and happy to answer questions and discuss anything that I've mentioned and hope this is, this is helpful information as you're considering this bill. Thank you very much. Committee, Senator Hooker. Um, it sounds like the, the full McGill I hear. <laughs> I think it's great. All of these things combined. And um, it's interesting, you know, that you, I, I was looking at your charts to see which states have elements of all of those elements. And I also was interested in your chart about the um, scoring for students from Vermont, which seemed to me to be pretty high for a state that doesn't have that. So I guess kids are learning. I don't know, maybe it's in the air. But it's, it's yeah, good. it is. It's interesting. And we did look at whether we could find a relationship between those. We looked at the AP US government and politics exam because that's one of the only state level measures of civic achievement, uh, civic education achievement. But there isn't really, as you can tell, there isn't really a relationship. And, and part of that is that this, it's not great data for looking at cross state comparisons, honestly, because as you all know, not every student takes the AP government and politics exam and not every school even offers that type of exam. So it's, it's one measure. And uh, as you said, the students in Vermont who take that exam do very well, uh, but it's hard to know what that means compared to other states. Exactly. So I guess a question I have is, 
um, do you have recommendations for ways to affect these um, learning um, opportunities for kids? And, and you know, you talked about preschool, pre-K through high school. So what would you suggest that uh, of a way of infusing um, exposure, I guess is the only word I can come up with, to uh, civics and government and learning about all of these facets of our society uh, throughout a student's education. And one thing that I think might be useful is for, uh, I mean, it would likely be your Department of Education to examine the standards that are currently in place. I think both on the reading language arts side and on the social studies side to see where there might be opportunities to infuse some of these concepts earlier on. And so that could be at, in, at the middle school level, making sure that students are reading some of these founding documents at, at the appropriate level at the appropriate time. And it could be at the um, elementary school level as part of social studies uh, classes or electives, uh, having some sort of civic engagement projects or community engagement projects uh, or ways to just start to understand what it means to be part of a community, who are the members of the community, those sorts of things. So looking at those standards uh, across K through 12 and just figuring out where some opportunities are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sarger, how do you, how does your organization, if you do it all, do you interact with agencies of education throughout the United States? Uh, are, are you a resource in, in, in different ways if people, if agencies were to reach out to you? We just had a good conversation with our agency, for example, uh, and they're going to come back to us in after sort of assessing where we are at and where they think some of uh, our assistance, if you will, the legislature might be needed. How, how do you work with agencies or even teachers, principals directly? Uh, we do work with state education departments. Sometimes we also work uh, with the governors and governor's education policy advisors. Sometimes we'll work with state legislatures and, uh, like yourselves and we do different types of things. So we'll do testimony like this. Sometimes we'll provide technical assistance memos uh, or analysis to states. And often that's what we'll do uh, for say a governor or for a state education commissioner uh, based on some of the research we've done looking at you know, comparisons across the country and looking at specific aspects of uh, uh, whatever the state is looking at. So. We're not a we're not a kind of consulting firm. We don't do that kind of work, but we have, part of our mission is to help enact policy change across the country. And so, if we have an opportunity to do that by working directly with the state, we we love to be able to do that. Great, Senator Lyons, I see. You, I think you're going to to unmute, but I could be I could be wrong. Um, well, I was going to ask questions, but I think uh, Cheryl actually asked the question as I looked through the article that we have on our web page and I noticed that Vermont, there were a lot of NAs and not available um, information for Vermont, yet we seem to do quite well. Um, and so I guess here's a question for you. Uh, do, is there something broken? I mean, how do we determine? If we have something broken, uh, our, you know, our voter turnout is pretty good in this state, at least it has been. Um, we have younger kids voting. We have pretty good turnout for um, town meeting. So, but how do we determine what is broken? I guess that's, that's the question. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that's sometimes difficult for us at the national level to figure out, obviously. We um, have certain data sources that are available. And so that's what we look at. And so um, things like the, the AP scores, um, looking at some of the voter participation rates, some of those uh, youth volunteerism rates. It turns out, um, as you probably could tell, we don't have data on a couple of those for Vermont, unfortunately, from like, the Census Bureau. And, at BLS, but there might be additional data that you have available at the state level from your state education department on say, um, if there are end of course exams in social studies courses, um, or if there's 
the metrics that you have on different types of community engagement, um, like our, what are the volunteerism rates? Um, you mentioned participation in community meetings, which is a, a good one. Um, are there other sort of uh, local or national service measures that you might want to take a look at? And there, there might be some other aspects that, again, you have specific data on from the education department that could help shine a light on where the, the particular gaps are. Well, I think it would be a fascinating relationship between the Department of Education and the Secretary of State to determine the number of volunteers who turn out for uh, vote counting and elections uh, in general. I mean, and even those of us who are justice of the peace, we don't get paid for the work that we do. So it's all, uh, we have a very strong volunteer um, presence. So that actually, that would be kind of fun to look at and see what difference that makes. And it might be useful to be able to, again, this is something that you might be able to do at the state level that we can't really do at the, the national level is look at differences across school districts across communities in the state. And if you're able to figure out where, uh, where there are communities that are doing this particular well and where there are ones that are struggling and that could be an area to, to focus resources and attention and if things, things might look very positive at the statewide level, but there might be particular places in the state where uh, you really need to yeah, focus resources and attention. Thank you. Mr. Sargrad, you were with the Agency of Education, I believe, during the Obama administration? I was, yes. How, how you know, and right now, things have changed, uh, particularly, I think, for Vermont, where our U.S. Senator, Patrick Leahy, is the chair of appropriations. Um, Senator Bernie Sanders is overseeing, uh, 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 I guess, the design and construction of mittens, according to everything <laughs> I've seen on social media. <laughs> But in all seriousness, you know, how I'm new to being the chair, there are new members to this committee, new members to the Senate. How might we uh, look to partner, a state might look to partner with the Agency of Education at the federal level? I've always believed Vermont's so perfect for pilot programs to try things that then we could, you know, uh, see how they work and perhaps other states could pick them up. How would you best, and, and and I've been encouraging and our, everyone, Senator Lyons, everyone here is, recognizes that we might have a particularly unique opportunity with Senator Leahy in this position to try certain things. How would you suggest we as a committee reach out, work with the, the agency of education at the federal level? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there are, obviously things are changing by the day with the sure. new administration coming in, um, but. Typically, there the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is one of the offices that I worked in when I was there. Uh, we administer most of the major grant programs, and one of the big ones that is related to civics education is it's called the Title IV uh, Block Grant, and it's a fairly large amount of money that's fairly flexible for states, and that's I think an opportunity to think about priorities in the state. And so, if civic education, civics engagement, educating for democracy is a top state priority. I think there might be ways to work with the Department of Education at the federal level to get some technical assistance on best practices and to connect to, they're really good at connecting states with each other who are thinking about some of the same issues. And so they might be able to help with that. And, and also if there are specific uh, programs that you'd like to be able to fund, say you identify that you want to do something with um, say an organization like Generation Citizen or iCivics, um, whether there are particular sources of funding that can be used for that kind of partnership that maybe your state education department hasn't identified yet. And so the, that kind of relationship with, um, ultimately it'll be the assistant secretary for that office of elementary and secondary education, but there's also other points of contact that are, uh, that worked directly with state and local government officials on all sorts of different issues. But there's there's gonna be, I think, good people there who you'll be able to talk to and the, uh, the career staff there who manage these programs are excellent and are really good at uh, being able to problem solve with states too. Terrific, it's very helpful. Um, I just have actually one uh, final question and, uh, and then I'm not sure if committee members have others, but 
you did mention media and news literacy. Uh, I'm wondering if you might say a little bit more about that, what that kind of kind of work does. And then I'm also wondering if you could just talk about economic literacy, if you will. You know, something that I believe is, is rooted in, in, in some of our needs, I guess, some of our uh, perhaps deficits uh, is in understanding sometimes of economics. And I, I'd like to talk for a moment about the intersection, if you will, or if you see an intersection between economics and, and civic education. Really interesting. I mean, I think on the news and media literacy side, and those are two separate things that are important to think about a little bit differently. Media literacy, we think about as all the different forms of media, and particularly now with the rise of all different types of social media platforms, how do students understand what they're seeing on social media and other forms of media and how to make judgments about the uh, trustworthiness, reliability of different sources? And, and what does it mean to engage in social media as a student. I mean, that's also something that's important for students to learn, not just from a civic engagement standpoint, but from a understanding how the world works in the 21st century and what it means to be uh, present online. So that's kind of the media literacy side. And the news literacy is a little bit more specific to different sources of news and different types of uh, different types of news sources and how to you know, judge where the uh, information is coming from, how to uh, process information that might be coming from uh, print news, that might be coming from television news, and, and understanding you know, what the, the different types of distinctions are between news sources as opposed to more broadly thinking about uh, all different sources of media and social media in particular. Um, the, the economics question is interesting. And, and are you, I'm just a, a little bit curious, are you thinking about some of the like principles of economics and how that relates to principles of government and kind of how government and the economy work together, that sort of thing? Yes, I, well, I'd say both, how, how the government and economy, yeah, do work together, uh, how sometimes, um, yeah, I, I would leave it there actually, how, how government and the economy you know, work together and understanding broadly, uh, generally of economics. Uh, I, I don't know how much it is in our schools, but certainly there, there's a connection there. We know there's a connection between government and money. Uh, and I, I don't know how much, how much curriculum there is out there, how much of, of that connection is, is being taught. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's even, I would say it's even a little bit broader than that and the idea of information about kind of the future workforce. I mentioned this very briefly, but making sure students have access to information about careers, about um, how they're going to be able to find a family sustain, a job with a family sustaining wage, uh, what industries are high growth, high wage industries, what career pathways that they could start in high school are able to uh, get them to post -sec their education and training and a good job. And I think that is also related to the broader idea of the, the economy and understanding of economics and how the, the economy is changing. That's ultimately yeah. what is going to impact the student success. And that I think is certainly related to uh, the idea of understanding the, or our system of government, the functions of government, how government impacts um, different sectors of the economy and um, thinking about the, the regulatory frameworks on sectors of the economy. And this is stuff that uh, maybe is a little much for like, infusing into kindergarten social yeah. studies standards, but uh, is something that seems important as especially high school students are thinking about their next steps. Yeah. yeah it's just interesting, a, a former faculty member and uh, well, college educator uh, used to talk about how, you know, well, there are all sorts of, again, things connected. I mean, money, uh, war, the military, all these things are, are in a way, you know, certainly connected to civic education and how can, how can we just give students this broad, important education? You pick up the newspaper every day, there's something on the front page about money, there may be something on the front page about, about war or, or, or military, you know, how do we talk about these things with young people? How do we educate young people so that they, they can digest and use the material um, effectively. 
Yeah, I think coming back, I keep coming back to this idea of engagement and civic engagement. I think that yep. is really key. They want to help students understand that what they do is connected to what they see in the news yeah. in their communities. And so I think that's why um, I've been emphasizing how important it is to go beyond just the uh, sort of foundational pieces of yeah. your typical civics course and helping students understand how you solve a problem in your community. And that's sort of right. fundamentally civic engagement. And that's related to all these things I think that you're talking about. Great. Question, Senator Perchlick, anything? Senator Hooker. Just as a comment, I think that it's important for us to not segregate history from civics and what's going on today. And um, we tend to, and, and that's one of the things that I'm beginning to um, sense and feel that a course in civics is certainly isn't the answer um, because we can't put it into a silo. And unless we understand how history has affected how we got here, then how can we understand what we're doing now? So I, I think it's important for us to make that connection as well. Thank you. Committee, any other questions or comments? Mr. Sargrad, thank you very much. Uh, we owe you at least, I'd say a quart, if not more of maple syrup. Uh, we, this has been very helpful and we look forward to continuing as much as you're willing to engage us, engage the state of Vermont, uh, work with us, and we will certainly be reaching out to you and, and you can always say, Hey, I, I, I've had enough guys. We can, uh, unless I get another thing of maple syrup, I'm not going to dial in, but I really do, uh, immensely, uh, I think we all do appreciate your time and everything you do, uh, and have done to, uh, improve and, and make advances in education. Thank you again. This is a great opportunity and I'm really excited to see what you all do. And again, like I mentioned, happy to engage in however is helpful and get my team connected with, with other folks in Vermont. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Committee, I uh, hope folks found that interesting. Um, just a, again, another perspective, uh, somebody who I think is doing interesting work. We do have one more witness, but I thought we would take a, a little break. Um, Professor uh, Levinson from uh, Harvard Education uh, School of Education uh, will be joining us. She's also someone that someone uh, was pointed in my direction, again, just to have a conversation uh, a little bit for maybe the last uh, 30 minutes or so and see and get some of her thoughts on, uh, again, continuing the conversation around educating for democracy. And then of course, if, if we should have a committee discussion uh, at some point in the next day or early next week around the direction after people have had some time to think about this, the direction that you would all like to go in. Um, and I think uh, I appreciate the two witnesses from the Agency of Education and, and their willingness to kind of take some time, get a sense of where they're at, um, see if what they might need from us, uh, what they believe they might do to improve on these issues and, and hear from them again. But in the meantime, any thoughts that people have uh, after today, uh, please feel free to, uh, we'll have some committee discussion or or you can always uh, bring in extra witnesses, et cetera. But I think it's, it's an interesting time uh, and an interesting topic. So with that, let's uh, just uh, take another stretch and a break and we'll come back at 4.15 for our last witness. Thank you. Hi. How are you? I'm Here. Brian Campion. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you and thank you for joining us. We're just uh, coming back from a break. So we just might need just a few moments, a few seconds. Sure, yeah, that's totally fine. Are we reaching you in Cambridge, Massachusetts? I live in Jamaica Plain, which is a neighborhood of Boston. But yes, yes, I uh, used to live on Riverway. Oh, yes, we live on the Arbor Way. All right, yeah, my partner did uh, graduate work at BU, and so uh, we were there for a few years. Uh huh. Good part of the world. Well, we're so pleased that you were able to join us today for a little while just to discuss uh, civic education. Um, we have been uh, in the thick of it today and uh, trying again, as I mentioned in my email, to try to 
you know, see what we can do uh, in our committee, as well as with our colleagues to foster a strong democracy. I know this is something that you have thought uh, quite a bit about um, in your life and in your work. And so I just thought we might take uh, just, a, you know, just a bit to hear from you to get some of your thoughts. Um, we are looking at, I, I think, from today's discussion, we certainly realize it is more than just a class, uh, you know, in terms of fostering a democracy, and and, uh, and yet certainly education uh, all the way through, and one's family life and other things are are, are key. I know, speaking for myself, you know, uh, a grandfather who was a judge and getting engaged, you know, his conversations with us as children was you know really really important, uh, and I think without a doubt it it helped foster an interest and a commitment to uh, you know, public engagement, civic uh, giving back, et cetera. So with that, uh, welcome to Senate Education. Uh, thrilled to have you. And I, uh, as you can look around, you have a, an engaged audience. You have Senator Perslick from the state capitol area, Montpelier, Senator Chittenden from Burlington area, Senator Terenzini, uh, and Senator Hooky, Hooker, both of whom are from the center of the states, uh, Rutland, and mm -hmm. Senator Lyons, uh, also from uh, Chittenden County uh, near Burlington. So with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you for a few moments. Great. Um, so I think it will help if I, uh, since I know you guys seem to have spent all day on this, which seems exhausting, um, and uh, great, like I'm thrilled that you're spending all day thinking about, you know, uh, how to foster uh, kids' civic learning, but I also don't want to, like, tread ground, you know, that you've already heard tons of times before, um, and, like, it will help me if I can just speak to sort of the questions that you have or what what's on your mind. So I can just tell you like, you know, the buckets of kinds of things that I could talk to you about. Sure. Uh, and then maybe, I don't know if you just want to put in the chat, <laughs> like among the buckets you mentioned, Mira, these are the things you, that we're actually like either disagreeing about or haven't heard about yet or would love to hear more about or whatever. So I'm happy to talk about um, what we know specifically about good curricular based civic education, you know, like in a, a designated civics class like you have in the bill or more broadly like in social studies. I can talk about how, what we know about kids civic learning within schools more broadly, which as you already noted, Senator Campion is uh, more than just civics class and is also, you know, like extracurriculars, co-curricular opportunities, student government and school culture, what happens in the lunchroom, things like that. So I can talk about everything related to sort of kids civic learning outside of the formal curriculum. Um, uh, I can talk about what we know about how young people um, get civically engaged overall, like what the chief predictors are, um, uh, some of which is schooling, but as you've mentioned uh, with your uh, grandfather, the judge, and the kinds of conversations you had at the dinner table, a lot of which is outside of school, um, and so we can talk about that. Or the fourth bucket I can talk about is what we know um, about sort of who tends to get high quality civic experiences and civic learning and who tends to be more highly civically and politically engaged and empowered and who tends to be less so. Uh, this is what I call the civic empowerment gap. So I think I'm happy to talk about any of those, all of those, none of those, just to answer questions. So I don't know, do you mind just like taking a minute and throwing into the chat? We can just have an open conversation. Or, or just have an open conversation. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Senator Persley just texted me. He has a seven o'clock firm stop. So we have plenty of, we have about two and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, uh, why don't we begin with, if the committee doesn't mind, what are the chief predictors? What are the things that, you know, get people, uh, you know, engaged, if you will? What are those chief predictors out there? Sure. And Senator Lyons, did you have something you wanted to ask? Oh, or say Senator Lyons, you, you... Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, 
let me just remember what it was exactly. <laughs> Uh, so much of civic engagement revolves around uh, communication skills and uh, interpersonal skills, being able to articulate uh, things in a very, in a meaningful and um, not a derogatory way. We've seen enough of that recently. So, so I guess my question is when there's a conflict between home and learning environments and where does the who, which role model wins? I guess is uh, to say, what are your what does your research tell us about uh, the relative importance of family versus school, for example, and That's how to overcome point. some of the negative that we see. Great place to start. And Professor, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit more? You know, I I just I, I didn't really key that up well sure well so if you don't mind just saying a few words about yourself yeah exactly yeah that's fine and hold on let me just and then we can move right to center lines very good question sure um uh okay so yeah i so i'm mira lonson feel free to call me mira um uh, and I am a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I have taught since 2007. Um, before 2007, I was an eighth grade uh, teacher uh, for eight years over a 10 year period. So I taught in the Boston Public Schools for five years. I taught in the Atlanta Public Schools for three years. Um, and actually before I was an eighth grade teacher, I actually did my doctorate in political theory at Oxford and I did a BA in philosophy at Yale before that. So I had a sort of oddly wending thing where I did philosophy and political theory. Um, I wrote my dissertation about education. Then I became an eighth grade teacher because I actually wanted to do something meaningful for the world. And then eventually I wended my way back into academia. Um, uh, more or less because uh, my husband convinced me that I could not keep on being a full-time urban eighth grade teacher and a parent to then our two young daughters and try to finish this book and sort of keep an academic life going on the side. So um, when Harvard gave me a job offer, I thought, well, BPS will take me back, but Harvard probably won't hold this out forever. So I took it and then I've, uh, and then I've been there ever since. And so in, yeah, Senator Hooker. I was curious to know what you taught in eighth grade. Oh yeah, so um, depending on the year, I taught um, English, American history, humanities, which was a combination of the two, or also I helped Boston um, develop and pilot their eighth grade civics in action program. So for my last two years in BPS, um, I taught civics in action. Uh, so it sort of depended. Uh, uh, and um, I also sort of on the, so on the civic side of the ledger, um, so I mentioned that I taught for eight years over a 10 year period. So I did three years in Atlanta, three years in Boston. Then I actually had two years of postdocs uh, when I started work on what was then my second book uh, and which be ended up becoming No Citizen Left Behind, which is a book about the civic empowerment gap as I call it and uh, the ways in which we actually have a civic empowerment gap in this country that's sort of parallel to the academic achievement gap and how as we have taken greater responsibility for the academic achievement gap over the last 25 years or so, and no longer just blamed kids or parents or families for the academic achievement gap, but have taken on responsibility for that as a system. Similarly, I argue we should take on responsibility for the civic empowerment gap and that it's um, kind of anti-democratic that we can predict who has civic and political power in this country based on say their level of education or their um, level of wealth or income or um, their race and ethnicity, which is basically what we can do. Um, so uh, it was wrestling with questions around what it was that I was doing as an eighth grade teacher that sort of led me in the end toward that. I also edited, uh, co-edited a book called Making Civics Count um, with Rick Hess at the American Enterprise Institute and uh, David, Campbell at Notre Dame. Um, and I was one of the civics writers for the C3 frameworks uh, for state social studies, uh, for state standards in uh, history, geography, economics, and civics. 
Um, and I've served on the board of Generation Citizen and on the advisory board for Tisch uh, College. Uh, and um, I'm on the advisory board for the Democratic Knowledge Project. And I've done other sort of, you know, civic advisory stuff. I was on the um, board for the campaign for the civic mission of schools, et cetera. So I've sort of had, I guess, for the last 20 years or so, some hand in civic education in various ways. I've worked, I'm now on the board of scholars for Facing History and Ourselves and helped them develop their uh, choosing to participate curriculum and things like that. So that's sort of who I am in relation to the work that you do. Um, uh, Senator Lyons's question is one that I think actually is super important and interesting and really actually complicated to answer. Um, so the, the, what makes it, so you sort of said, all right, like who wins between schools and, and families? And as you might predict, there is no good answer to that question, right? Um, uh, we know, and, it, and this is in part actually, when we think about civic learning, it's similar in that respect to other forms of learning, right? So as you probably know, you know, we put a huge amount of emphasis on schools to facilitate kids learning, right? That's where we think of learning happening. We also know that schools as a whole have about like 15%, right? Like, you know, you can sort of, if you're trying to predict who is going to learn and achieve and how much they're going to achieve and so forth, about 15% is on the schools and about 85% is on out of school factors, right? So if you know that a child is poor, you know a lot more about their likely educational trajectory than that you know that they go to Bass Middle School as opposed to Washington Middle School, right? Um, and so in that respect, you know, families play a huge role in terms of civic learning and civic skills and civic engagement, just as they play a huge role in terms of academic learning and engagement. And at the same time, the fact that families are super predictive doesn't mean that we like would pull away schools for academic learning, right? Schools are essential. If we, in the absence of schools, we, we would lose a ton of learning, right? And so in that respect, if we have schools that are actually serious about engaging kids in meaningful high quality civic learning, including the kind of civic learning that you're talking about, Senator Lyons, with respect to learning certain um, attitudes and dispositions of tolerance, civility, mutual respect, um, ability to take multiple perspectives, interest in um, alternative opinions and a willingness to engage with others as opposed to demonize them or you know whatever, right? Um, schools are incredibly important places for teaching that. And schools that teach that well can have a really profound impact on students. So that's why I'm saying it's a hard thing to answer. Uh, it's not as if schools aren't dispositive. I guess like, you know, philosophers make this distinction between um, uh, what's necessary and what's sufficient. You might think of schools as being um, neither necessary nor sufficient for good civic learning, right? There are kids who can engage in good civic learning at home and they're great. For other kids, it's both necessary and sufficient. And for a lot of kids, it will help like tip them over and give them the skills and the dispositions that you know their families may wanna give them but aren't going to give them as well as schools can, for example, uh, you know, my children are raised, like my husband and I are politically probably about, I don't know, 83% aligned, say. And it means that our kids are not exposed to a huge amount of uh, diversity in political opinion, right? You know, they'll hear us debate like the 17% where we don't align, but mostly they are raised to take some things as given and other things as obviously wrong. And so if they were not attending school with kids who are being raised with highly aligned parents on very different, you know, along a very different balance, they wouldn't learn that, right? They wouldn't have the practice of engaging with very different viewpoints and they wouldn't learn actually, you know, hopefully, 
I'm trying to think like I try to model with our kids a lot of respect for political viewpoints that differ fairly wildly from my own. My husband is somewhat more dismissive of, you know, some of those viewpoints. But even, you know, if I think I'm modeling like a spirit of civility and open mindedness, uh, there's no way that they could learn from me in the absence of engaging with families who have very different, you know, perspectives and values and standpoints. Um, you know, what they do because they go to school. The one other thing I'll say uh, before I, I either open it up for questions again or turn to the question that you asked, Senator Campion, um, is that the another part of the question that you asked, uh, Senator Lyons, is not just about like, you know, who wins or, or what is the impact, but how can schools navigate, right, the, the um, the political moment that we are in right now and the political moment that we've been in for the last few years and likely will continue being in for the next few years, no matter what happens, you know, even though President Biden has now been inaugurated and no matter what happens with uh, impeachment and conviction, uh, right, that the, um, that we're right now in a hyper-partisan time with a lot of mutual mistrust, mutual demonization, and very, very different um, sources of news and perspectives on what is simply true, right? So when we are living in very different worlds like that, schools are both more essential than ever as places for students to learn to engage civically with one another and in the broader world, and also in a more tenuous position than ever, because what they say or do um, is, sorry, and I thought I had turned it off, but there's some other phone. Oh, I see. Hold on. I'm, um, uh, sorry, I don't mean to be, there we are. Um, but they're, they're more vulnerable than ever to accusations of themselves being partisan uh, and themselves being um, political in the wrong way, right? So um, they're, so for example, uh, schools say five years ago, probably relatively rarely would have described themselves as engaging in anti-racist teaching, but they probably would have described themselves as trying to have, you know, racially inclusive classrooms and teaching their children, you know, not to be racially prejudiced, right? Like, you know, and they would have been, you know, saying, I have, uh, you know, a, a classroom that doesn't discriminate and I teach my kids, you know, not to engage in racial discrimination and we teach, you know, ra about racial equality. And that would have seemed totally normal, right? Like there's no question, but like that's just one of the basic civic values that one should teach in a classroom, right? Um, over the last five years, uh, there's been a slight shift in terminology from say teaching about racial equality to teaching anti-racism. There's also been a shift to um, seeing whether, even if it's actually talking about racial equality, to seeing that as being a partisan stand, one that signals say alignment with the left on all sorts of issues. And now teachers who say, you know, talk about trying to create an anti-racist classroom uh, can and you know are being accused of being partisan and actually anti-inclusive, um, uh, in particular not including uh, families or children who have uh, views that are you know more on the right. Now, on a like sort of logical basis, that's clearly false, right? There's no there's nothing that makes you know somebody with a more conservative viewpoint. Um, excluded by, you know, a classroom that's trying to teach racial equality and nobody, you know, will make that claim in a sort of logical manner, but in the way that the partisan valence of something like anti-racism 
has become so attached with the left that now teachers don't really, you know, that they, they will come under fire for doing that. They may be aligned with the left, right? They may be teaching about things that, you know, people on the right are actually legitimately upset by, or it just may be seen as being this partisan divide. Another example that's, I, uh, is like, you know, when I was teaching social studies uh, or civics or whatever I was teaching that, you know, year, it was really easy, say, if I wanted to do a debate uh, or to address, you know, some issue, I would know that, say, we could get a perspective from the right that was pro-free market, and we could get a perspective from the left that was more in favor of governmental regulation, say, right? And then if I had a free market article and a, you know, and a regulation article or something like that, we were representing a range of viewpoints on an issue, no matter what it was, and that was fine, right? And that was really clear for social studies teachers for many years for all sorts of stuff, right? Um, over, again, over the last four or five years, there's been just a real shift, right? Partly in the Democratic Party, much more in the Republican Party. Uh, and so it's much harder for social studies teachers and civics teachers to know whether or not what they are presenting will be perceived by people across the political spectrum, both as representing their own perspectives on the political spectrum and as representing a, a perspective that is legitimate to teach. So that's the other part of this, like the third feature of this that's really hard right now for teachers, which is that there's this disagreement, there's I think more profound disagreement right now than there was say 10 or 15 years ago about even what the sort of boundary lines are for the sort of the, the legitimate disagreement within those walls and the illegitimate claims outside those walls, right? So, um, there's a so there's a really wonderful civic education researcher, uh, uh, Diana Hess, who's currently the dean uh, at the University of Wisconsin uh, School of Education, and she wrote a book called Controversy in the Classroom. And it, uh, then in that book, she distinguishes between uh, what she calls open questions and settled questions. And then actually in a newer book that she wrote with Paula McAvoy called The Political Classroom, they then talk about open and settled empirical questions and open and settled policy questions. So um, I'm just going to focus on the policy side at the moment. So an, a settled policy question is whether or not women should vote, right? That was an open question for uh, a good century, right? Uh, it has now been, uh, it remained open even after the passage of the amendment, right? But eventually it, it was settled and nobody now thinks that we should teach or that like that a teacher would be appropriate to teach whether, you know, women should vote as being a truly open question, right? They should teach kids to respect, you know, all people's right to vote if they, you know, satisfy their criteria, regardless of gender identity, for example. Um, a question that was open for a long time more recently was uh, same-sex marriage, right? And uh, those on the left would like to consider that now to be a closed question right, uh, at following Obergfell uh, and say, it's done with, the Supreme Court has delivered its decision and it's a, clearly a matter of human rights and it's a matter of marriage equality. And you should not teach that as an open question. Again, you should teach that uh, people, no matter what their sexual identity, should have the right to, you know, under uh, the, the recognition of the law, uh, marry whomever they want to marry. On the other hand, if you flip that around to say the recognition of, cor of corporations as persons with Citizens United, the fact that that was also ruled by the Supreme Court uh, is a sudden reversal. And those on the left, under no circumstances, wish to you know, treat that as a settled question. 
uh, right? I mean, they believe that it was wrongly decided and that corporations should not be recognized as people and that corporate uh, expenditures should not be seen as being a First Amendment exercise of free speech. So, uh, whereas, you know, some on the right would absolutely like to uh, treat that as a settled question. So what we see is that many of the markers for what is settled versus open are themselves actually contested, depending on what one's substantive views are. And where teachers get really in trouble is when they want to teach something as open or as settled, where there is disagreement about which, you know, whether they're right about what that is. And Diana Hess calls this teaching in the tip. And she actually describes it for herself as when she was a, a student, um, she was taught that the Japanese internment camps were an unfortunate but appropriate response to, uh, you know, foreign aggression, right? Then she describes herself as a young teacher where she was really edgy with her colleagues by having students debate the Japanese internment camps. And she says, now she looks back at that and thinks, oh my gosh, what was I doing? Like it's so clearly settled now in the other direction, right? That the Japanese internment camps were uh, unconstitutional and it was wrong to have interned American citizens, right? You know, in camps based on their Japanese heritage, right? There are all sorts of questions that we are in this swirl of right now where again, we may disagree on whether they are open or settled and where and where there's movement. Um, and so teach, so this is my final thing to you, Senator Lyon, sorry. This is super hard for teachers right now because they will be treating, like if they teach something like Black Lives Matter and have students discuss it, they may you know, want to treat something as being settled that a, say, a child's parent as they overhear them on Zoom think either is open or is actually settled on the other side, right? Uh, and vice versa, they may want to teach something is open that a parent views as being settled. And that's where it gets uh, also really, really, really complicated for teachers. Wow. Uh, actually, that was terrific. That was terrific. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. Thank you. I, I'm regretting that we didn't book you for the day, uh, but we really do, unfortunately, have about 10 minutes, so at the most. So let's uh, let's see. Uh, Senator Hooker, please. I would rather yeah. people just jump that, in. That was, that was wonderful, and I wish we could go on for hours, and um, we may have to enroll in your one of your courses or something. But, uh, but my question has to do with what's in S-17, and I think the... Um, the um, goal of F S-17 is to uh, make sure that our students have an understanding of, of the formation of our government, the structure of our government, um, you know, what that means in their daily lives. And, you know, we, we can get into the weeds and it, it's fascinating. And as a former teacher, I can identify with the angst that you feel um, when you don't know whether or not you should be talking about something in class. But um, I think to at my question then is, how could we start, supposing we were starting with a clean slate pre-K mm -hmm. or something like that, um, what do we do to lay the foundation for these um, civic-minded individuals? So let me tell you something that I noticed is not in S-17 right now that I would encourage you to think about um, as a committee and as you work with the other co-sponsors. Um, so right now, what S-17 asks students to do is to learn a bunch of things about how government works and what the principles are uh, that drive government. Um, in this respect, it is potentially, it runs the risk of having students learn about how citizenship and government out there works it doesn't ask them to do any work about themselves as citizens 
or rights holders or responsibility holders. So this is something that I find super interesting uh, and kind of bizarre when about civic education that is different from any other thing that we try to teach kids to do in schools. So when we teach English in schools, for example, like we want kids to be good writers, we want them to be good readers, we want them to be good communicators. One of the major ways in which we do that is we get them to read and to write and to communicate, right? They spend some time studying how other people write and communicate and even read, right? So, you know, they may learn that good readers uh, visualize and ask questions. And so you assign somebody in their reading circle to be the visualizer and the question asker and so forth, right? But then you're having them do that, right? They're, you're having them practice the skills of good reading as they're doing their literature circles. You're having them write every week. You're having them give talks, you know, all this stuff. To have them learn math, you're having them do math every day, right? They often do math badly, right? They make all sorts of mistakes, but that's the whole point is that's how they learn how to do the math well, right? When we want them to learn to play basketball or baseball, we're enrolling them in little league, we're signing them up for club sports. Like they're, they're doing this year after year after year after year because we think that's how they will learn to be baseball players. Even though we don't expect them to go off and become professional baseball players, we don't expect many of them to go off and use math you know, beyond basically like late elementary or maybe algebra and you know most of what they do but we think you have to do this in order to learn this and to develop an identity as I can be a mathematician I can be a writer I can be a reader civics is the only thing where we ask kids to learn about how other people do citizenship instead of having them do citizenship it's, it's just so weird to me, right? Like if we want kids to learn to be mathematicians, we ask them to do math, to be readers, we ask them to read, to be baseball players, we ask them to play baseball. If we want them to learn citizenship, we should ask them to do citizenship, right? Um, like that's, you know, that's what we know about good learning in absolutely every other domain of life. And unlike, frankly, baseball, or as I suggest, even math or say biology or whatever, every single child who is going through the Vermont public schools is growing up to be a rights holder and a responsibility holder, to have a civic roles and responsibilities, whether or not they're, you know, a full American citizen, right? And so they, that's what we know about kids. <laughs> is that they will have civic rights and responsibilities. We don't know anything about else about their li lives, but we do know that. So we should have them doing citizenship. And that I feel is the sort of core thing that's right now missing in S17. Um, and you know, I, that's what's missing in most civic education, frankly, is that we have kids learn how other people have done citizenship. That's great. I mean, I, I yeah, I think, Brilliant what you said. I mean, we don't know if you're going to be a mathematician or a basketball player, but we know you're going to be a citizen. You're, we know you're going to have some kind of civic life here in the United States. And so getting students to actually do it is, is, is great. Uh, please, Senator Chittenden. So thank you for that last comment. One of the concerns I raised early on, and I, I really hope I don't offend anybody who wrote the bill. My, my concern is I, I don't want politicians defining curriculum because what you just described for me is something that I'd want educators factoring into how do we teach civics and they know teaching, they know kids, they know pedagogical approaches. So a thank you for saying it that way and that what you don't see in the bill is how you truly ingrain the action and, and the active acti activities that can create the modern day educational experience where it will really internalize uh, civic education. So uh, my, my, my concern persists and I don't know how to rectify it in today's discussion, but I really appreciate your last comment. Great. Yes, as we said uh, uh, earlier, uh, Professor Levinson, we, this is a, a bill that a colleague of ours put in. There are some other people that co-sponsored it. It's a kind of a starting point uh, to have a discussion. Um, and it, I think just having it here before us helps raise these questions and, and is getting us to think um, in different ways. If I may, I am would like to just go back, if you don't mind, concluding with who, who are the winners and losers right now around how do we predict, I think was the way actually you said it, 
the chief predictors of whether or not students are going, young people are going to get engaged? Um, so the very strongest predictor uh, now and over time is the number of years of education. So uh, if you uh, look, as, say, you know, as simple as voting uh, rates, but also as uh, at other things, uh, college graduates are, you know, disproportionately involved, and high school dropouts are disproportionately uninvolved, and it tracks really linearly, right? You know, by high school graduates, some college college graduates, in fact, then advanced degrees. That is the most uh, strong predictor. The other predictors, uh, unfortunately, in my view, uh, wealth and income are also incredibly strong predictors. And, uh, you know, I assume that you all know that as elected officials, because uh, you know uh, who does vote, um, uh, is more likely to vote, and also, you know, have power, obviously, through uh, financial donations, but also, you know, interestingly, both education and income are positively associated with things like participating in protests, uh, testifying uh, to elected or appointed officials, uh, working with others to solve a community problem, um, uh, sharing their political views online, uh, you know, like, doesn't really matter what the uh, kind of civic or political activity is, people with higher levels of income and higher levels of education tend to be more there. And then third of all, uh, race and ethnicity are also highly predictive. So African-Americans and whites vote at about the same rate, uh, which actually means that in that respect, because African-Americans on average uh, have somewhat lower uh, levels of education and definitely lower levels of both income and wealth than uh, whites do, that they are kind of civic superstars in that respect with respect to voting. But along other dimensions, actually, uh, whites outperform blacks along various kinds of civic uh, uh, participation. And particularly uh, Asian American and Latino and Latina um, Americans uh, have much lower levels of civic and political participation. And this is when you're just looking at citizens. This is not because of say differences um, in citizenship status. Even if you're just looking at citizens, say um, Asian and uh, Hispanic citizens tend to vote uh, at substantially lower rates uh, historically have than black and white um, uh, citizens. And so unsurprisingly, it is also the case, uh, you know, because this is as true for civic education as it for anything else, that schools that serve wealthier families and communities and also whiter families and communities tend to provide more civic learning opportunities, both through um, within the classroom, they're more likely to have uh, open classroom discussions, debates, simulations, things like that, then schools that serve uh, lower income kids and uh, communities of color. They're also more likely to have student government, to have school newspapers or podcasts or web pages that kids are involved in, things like that. They're more likely to have extracurricular activities that the students are taking leadership roles in. Um, whereas schools that serve lower income kids and kids of color are more likely to have both fewer extracurricular activities, but also have those extracurricular activities be more adult led as opposed to student led. Um, and, you know, that's another domain in which uh, kids develop uh, civic skills and dispositions. So in all of those ways, uh, we end up seeing, you know, differences in the kinds of civic learning opportunities that kids receive. Professor Levison, I, I do apologize. We need to leave it there. I, I yeah. think uh, this your your even brief time with us was absolutely incredible, and certainly has left us all uh, thinking, at least speaking personally, differently around what kinds of things we might do. Um, so right. let's let's, if possible, uh, we may be back in touch. But this sure. is hugely hugely helpful. Great. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Thank best you. of luck with us. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, committee. We Thank are you. Uh, I'm afraid we must adjourn for the day uh, rather abruptly, uh, but um, look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow.